We had a closed session go a little longer than expected, so we are grateful for your patience. I'm going to call to order the November 12, 2018 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Mayor Pro Tem Douglas, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. As the fourth Thursday in November approaches, let us give thanks. We give thanks for shelter, food, and warmth, and the love of friends and family. We give thanks to the servicemen and women who keep our country safe, and to our police officers and firefighters who protect us and our city. We give thanks to the citizens who join, volunteer, and lead to make Royal Oak better. Let us also pledge to be kind in what we say to and of others, and to share our abundance with those less fortunate. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, that brings us to item number four on the agenda, which is the presentation of the police department golf fundraiser check to the animal shelter. Chief O'Donohue. Uh, gentlemen, I think we have uh, some sh volunteers from our animal shelter here, correct? Um, Mayor, city commissioner, uh, this year our sixth annual uh, Royal Oak Police Department charity golf outing. Uh, the police department, in partnership with uh, Tony and Dan Yesbeck from Fifth Avenue, uh, we put on a great fundraiser. It was a great event. For the second year in a row, the Royal Oak Animal Shelter is the beneficiary. Uh, this year, we raised $28,314.69 for the animal shelter. Wow. Over the last two years, we raised over $55,000 for the animal shelter. So um, I, I'd just like to comment that couldn't do it without the partnership uh, with Fifth Avenue, with Tony and Dan, also Lieutenant Moore and Sergeant Stanton in the Royal Oak Police Department. They did all the heavy lifting. I just golfed. And uh, <laughs> so we're very proud of this, uh, this endeavor and uh, I'd like to present to our Animal Shelter Committee. All right, that's real much. Nice. Interesting asterisk to this uh, this year's outing. I actually golfed for the first time. I started golfing this year, and somehow I landed in the Chiefs uh, foursome. And despite the fact that I'm still really, really, really bad, I managed to make it through all 18 holes without getting arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this brings us to item number five, um, and then we'll do item number six after that. Item number five is a proclamation designating November 24th, 2018 as Small Business Saturday. And item number six will be proclamation congratulating Jimmy's Kids' 30th anniversary. So let's start with Small Business Saturday. I'm going to come on down and read the proclamation. Cameron is here to receive the proclamation. He's our downtown manager, for those of you who haven't met him. Okay, this is a proclamation designating November 24th, 2018 as Small Business Saturday. Whereas the city of Royal Oak, Michigan, celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are currently 28.8 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all businesses with employees in the United States and are responsible for 63% of net new jobs created over the past 20 years. And whereas small businesses employ over 49% of all businesses with employees in the United States, and whereas 89% of consumers in the United States agree that small businesses contribute positively to the local community by supplying jobs and generating tax revenue, and whereas 87% of consumers in the United States agree that small businesses are critical to the overall economic health of the United States, 
And whereas 93% of consumers in the United States agree that it is important for people to support the small businesses that they value in their community. And whereas the city of Royal Oak, Michigan supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our neighborhoods. And whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, Mayor Fournier, and the members of the Royal Oak City Commission hereby proclaim Saturday, November 24, 2018, as Small Business Saturday in the city of Royal Oak, Michigan, and urge our residents and residents from other communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. Sean, this is. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any words? Uh, yeah, a couple. Should I go over here? Or? You can come right here. Okay. Uh, well, first, I want to thank the, the mayor and the city commission for this proclamation. Um, I also want to thank the DDA board. Uh, we have a fantastic DDA that supports small businesses here. And I just want to add that uh, we're doing a few things that are special for Small Business Saturday, uh, which includes uh, if you shop at a participating small business in downtown Royal Oak, you will, um, and if you spend more than $25 on that day, uh, you will receive a complimentary Royal Oak Canvas holiday tote and a Royal Oak holiday ornament. Um, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, been working with the DDA to provide free parking in all of the garages for Saturday, November 24th, too. So that's an extra perk that the uh, small businesses uh, asked for, and uh, we listened and we delivered. So thank you very much, and uh, shop small. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for all your efforts. Thank you, man. <laughs> Mr. Tooman, thank you for making it out tonight. Absolutely. Thank you for the honor here. Well, it's my honor, Mr. Tooman, and the honor of the City Commission to present this next proclamation. This is a proclamation congratulating Jimmy's Kids' 30th anniversary. Whereas Jim Tooman had a dream for every young child to feel safe, valued, and loved. And whereas in 1988, Jim set about making his dream a reality, creating Jimmy's Kids and providing 22 children with special needs a Christmas with toys, clothing, food, and whereas in 2018 will mark the 30th anniversary of Jimmy's Kids. And whereas from the humble start of 22 children, Jimmy's Kids now gives Christmas to over 25,000 children, either indigent, physically, or emotionally impaired, or without any parents. And whereas Jimmy's Kids has also expanded from the Christmas morning and Christmas parties programs to hosting special events at group homes, schools, and churches, helping at battered women's shelters and expanding their acts of kindness beyond the borders and providing disaster relief overseas. And whereas recognizing teen suicide, violence, and bullying are at, are at an epidemic crisis, Jimmy's Kids began programs to deal with these problems, including Voice of Reason, Circle of Influence, and Goals and Programs, which have have over 15 years of success in schools. And whereas Jimmy's Kids continues to develop new ways to help the most vulnerable children in society, including a new nationwide movie and documentary for public television that will have a call to action to alleviate these problems. Now, therefore be it resolved, I, Mayor Mike Fournier, and the members of the Royal Oak City Commission hereby congratulate Jimmy's Kids on their first 30 years of service and commend them for the difference they make in the lives of children. Mr. Tooman, thank you. I really accept this award on behalf of the more than 2,000 volunteers that have stepped up over 30 years that have come from different parts of the country and have served with the dream and the vision of making this better for kids in particular. We're, we're a grassroots charity that has defied odds. I started with 22 kids now, as Mayor said, we serve over 30,000. Our Christmas morning program is streamed all over the world. We've been invited to speak in Congress and, and in many, many states about the program and duplicating it. But here's where we defied the odds. We, I run this thing still out of the corner of my living room. And I've been running this for all those 30 years out of the corner of my living room on a budget under 25000 a year. And we're able to do this because 
of the true kindness of people out there who step up all the time and who really, whose hearts are real. And that's the key at a time in our history when we're struggling to come together and to see that, you know, in my mind, I'd rather be kind than be right mentality that now I'm, I've been speaking for the last 40 years. I've spoken to 2 million kids in 2,000 schools all over the world. And being kind as opposed to being right is the only way I think we're going to make it in this country today. Thank you for this honor. It is a privilege. Mr. Tubman, thank you very much. For thank you very much. How about another round for Chase Kidd? Inspiring words we can all learn from, Mr. Tuman. This brings us to item number seven, public comment. The City Commission values and relies on the input of our fellow citizens to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issues, both on the agenda and not. I ask that your comments be directed to the City Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. In addition to public comment, there will be a public hearing at tonight's meeting. If you're here to comment on the zoning ordinance amendments regarding food trucks, you may wait until the public hearings are opened and you can comment at that time. And the same rules apply uh, for, the, for that public hearing uh, as they do for general public comment. If you wish to speak tonight at either public comment or at the public hearings, please wait until recognized by me, the mayor, then come up to the podium. For the record, you'll state your name and your address. Please be mindful that the City Commission wishes to hear from anyone who wants to speak tonight, so comments are limited to three minutes or less, and we have a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. If you don't wish to speak tonight, that's all right. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us via email or uh, call the City Commission with your comments. Please note that the City Commission won't respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes and will address questions when the agenda topic is discussed or refer to the proper city department if the matter isn't scheduled to be on the agenda. Our city manager is also taking notes and he does look into matters and follow up as needed. Uh, one additional comment, I know sometimes during our discussions we come out here and you know we want to support one cause or another or one speaker or another. We do ask that we keep applause uh, limited or non-existent. Um, we have found as a general rule that if there's a dissenting opinion, uh, folks may be less likely to want to come up and express their freedom uh, to speak if they feel outnumbered in the room. So out of respect for everybody and, and, and whatever side of an issue you're on, we just ask that, you know, we don't applaud. Um, it does take up some time and it does infringe upon maybe others who want to speak uh, with a different opinion. So with that, who's first? Yes, sir, in the front with a fast hand. My name is Steve Atkinson. I live at 2901 North Wilson, Royal Oak. <clears throat> I've been here about 40 some odd years and I'm here to speak about Main Street, particularly where it intersects um, 13 Mile. Retired police officer, done a lot of traffic enforcement. What you have there at 13 Mile and Main Street is what we refer to at this time of year as a corn maze. You have white lines, yellow lines, green lines, straight lines, curved lines, dotted lines, slanted lines. It frankly looks like somebody was dropped in the middle of the intersection with a box of crayons. I'm particularly concerned about the left turn lane as it opposes the northbound through lane. The northbound through lane has to veer to the right in order to avoid the left turn lane. And the left turn lane, if you wish to follow the lines on the road, you actually have to go to the right to turn left, kind of like retirees in Florida. So the, the problem is there is this isn't broad daylight to a driver that's paying attention. These drivers don't normally pay attention as much as they should. So you have this situation where you have a left turn lane opposing a northbound through lane. This is just not a good situation. This is in broad daylight. So nighttime, rain, glare, snow, it's a bad intersection. In addition, no amount of traffic control device is going to make this go away. This is just not a very good situation. I'm thinking that uh, at a point in time, 
when uh, there's a number of accidents there, the opposing uh, attorneys do not have to sue each other. I think even a TV attorney can take one look at the intersection and decide to represent both drivers in an action against the city. In fact, the, one of the lanes actually crosses over the bike lane. Uh, I would ask each and every, every one of you to do the citizens a favor and drive southbound from 14 Mile on Main Street at rush hour. Ask yourself several questions. First of all, what do we do to Main Street? What are these uh, islands doing there? Why are there two lanes missing? Why is there an unused bike lane? But as you sit there with a half a mile backup at rush hour, take the time when you finally get to the intersection, move into the left turn lane and try to jockey it so you're the first person. And look down southbound on Main Street and ask yourself, is this make sense that I am facing the northbound through lane when I'm in a left turn lane? And I think if you do it enough times and you can avoid an accident, you'll probably do something to correct that intersection. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Um, Mr. Johnson, you stated that the uh, that has a plan to be restriped that's to address some of those that's concerns. That's supposed to be restriped, and it, if the weather and the contractor cooperate, that may even happen this week. I need to start with a bigger racer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Atkinson. Mr. Ashley. Thank you. Uh, I live at Royal Oak Manor. Uh, I'd like to discuss a problem that happened this past Friday. It concerns the Amtrak train. This happens quite a bit a lot. When the Amtrak is parked to pick up passengers at the Royal Oak stop, it moves, sometimes moves too far ahead, and it, signal, and it sets off the signal. The signals dropped last Friday. Traffic was back, and I had to make, go up Rochester to go north, so came around and go there. Traffic was backed up from the tracks on 6th Street all the way to Washington. It was backed up from the tracks, from the guards, uh, all the way back almost to Lincoln and almost to 4th. People were going around the guards. I tried to call Amtrak, could not get through. Somebody here has got to call Amtrak to have that train move back and stop setting off it. It was almost 15 minutes before that train got loaded and moved out. Before a car goes around those guards and gets smacked by an oncoming train going from the other direction and having a big mess at that intersection with a lot of cars, a lot of damage to other cars parked in the parking lot. This is an accident to happen. This cannot be going on because now we've got the holiday season and that Amtrak train runs more often <clears throat> now between now and Christmas because of holiday people going to Chicago and wherever. That train has got to move back before somebody or, and damage beyond a million dollars or more would happen with train cars flying all over the place. Please, somebody up here, contact Amtrak to get this fixed before somebody gets killed and worse, maybe have a fire and we lose businesses completely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Ms. Harrison back there. My new best friend. Laura Harrison, 2729 Trafford Road. I have two things I want to say. One is very quick. First, uh, number 16 on the agenda, the downtown task force. You start that up again. I have a suggestion. Maybe somebody will listen. You know, we have had a downtown task force for 30 years. It's called the DDA. The second D stands for development. Hello? The other thing I want to talk about is something very dear to my heart. I'm sorry I wasn't here, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, about the Serenay Motel. For over 40 years, I have been trying to eliminate those motels. 
on Woodward and the other ones too. But I reached the end of my rope seven years ago this month when my neighbor was murdered by one of those animals that lived in the Serenade Motel. I will never, ever forget the phone call from Peggy Goodwin that said, Laura, there's a homicide on your street. The woman was 80 years old. And that's it. I am so glad. And Patricia, you know what has gone on in those buildings for so many years. I am so glad, and I want to thank you. And if I never, ever forget to thank the police department for what they did to solve that case. It was unbelievable. We have the most wonderful park in our subdivision called the Nancy Daly Memorial Park that the city let us use their public property to install that park. And I want to say thank you for that. Anyhow, and I also want to wish everybody a very happy and peaceful Thanksgiving. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. <clears throat> Mr. Wayrun. Too. Um, Brendan Wayrung, 702 Irving. Last item on the agenda is uh, where you're going to make up our minds for us about the marijuana and how, what should be allowed and what shouldn't. Um, I think that you owe us uh, uh, time to express our uh, opinions. First, this needs to be five minutes, not three. Secondly, um, I think that uh, you should, uh, with the new city hall, install only rooms, large meeting, any room that a, uh, a public meeting can be held in should have the ability to be televised. Uh, that means this room here is the only one in the city that has uh, cameras. Uh, you don't even have them in room 309 where you do have lots of meetings. In the new city hall, you should have not only commission chambers, but the assembly room next door. And uh, the architect said there are other rooms, smaller rooms, where you could have meetings. You can just do something as simple as buying one of those $1,500 surveillance things from uh, uh, Costco and uh, have, a, have them taped, uh, or don't you tape them, you just put them on a computer. Uh, also, the police conference room. And as far as the marijuana initiative goes, you really need to have a uh, uh, town hall. You owe us a town hall where we give you our opinions before you give, before you give us ours. It, it, you really don't, uh, uh, you, you can't make up our minds. You, you have to know what we want because you're working for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myron. Mm. Put Dr. Anderson back there. Um, Dr. Wallace Anderson, 404 Mount Vernon Boulevard. I really didn't intend to come to address you tonight, but a couple of things came up yesterday that changed my mind. After class yesterday, my yoga teacher, who lives near the Boys and Girls Club, asked me what was going on with the construction at the south end of the farmer's market. I explained that it's the beginning stages of building a police station and a city hall in the farmer's market parking lots. And she exclaimed with horror, how do they expect people to continue to shop at the farmer's market with very limited surface parking? And she described her habit. 
she buys an arm load, she takes it to her car, and she returns to shop more, as many as two or three times per, per visit. She's a very tiny but very fit woman in her early 80s. She opined that the vendors could not survive if much close surface parking disappears. And I've talked with a few vendors who've expressed much, much the same concern. The construction phase would be difficult for them, but probably survivable if, after it's all over, there's appropriate parking for, this, for the shoppers. I had no comfort to offer my yoga teacher, who's been shopping there, as we have, for over 30 years. But then last night I was reading Sunday's Trib, and bingo! Chuck Semchena's column offers an approach that would preserve quite a bit of the parking, uh, likely save money, and benefit the environment. Instead of two buildings, go back to the drawing board, quite literally, and create a single taller building that would house both police and city offices. I've said before how troubled I am that the new project requires destroying much of the expanded south parking lot put in a very few years ago at quite an expense. Such carelessness with taxpayer dollars is reprehensible. So I encourage you, Mayor Fournier and members of the commission, to ask the planning department to make this common sense revision to the city center building plans. The gains from the change would far outweigh the losses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison with the fast hand. Slight of hand, maybe, but not fast hand. Bill Harrison, 2729 uh, Trafford and Royal Oak. Uh, here to ask the question again of uh, this $70,000 uh, advertising consultant. What are they doing? We haven't heard from them since a, a um, groundbreaking ceremony for the office, what was going to be an office building out here. Uh, and there's plenty of parking. All we hear is the, the impression that there's not enough parking downtown. And there's plenty of parking until the office, uh, Etkin office and the Ford Clinic uh, come online. And Mayor, you were on TV and it was alleged that there's not enough parking in downtown and you agreed. I don't understand this. Uh, again, I ask, what is the end game? Are you really trying to ruin Main Street so a big developer can come in and build something with a higher tax value? Makes me ask. You know, the post office, what I call the post office structure, the new structure across from a post office, I, I park there when I come to the meetings. And the north side, all the way up, is reserved parking from 8 to 5. Not just permit parking, but reserved. And still, the restaurants depend on parking after 5 o'clock. Uh, there should be plenty of parking for the restaurants, yet we have people going out of business because people perceive that there's not enough parking down here. So um, now, we, now that uh, the Ford Clinic is going to be at the uh, what was going to be an office building, we know why Andy Amos was denied valet parking on 2nd Street because the uh, clinic is going to be using 2nd Street for their entrance. Now, I'm just kind of betting, I don't bet a lot, that they're going to want some additional surface parking on the side of their building, which will have to be carved out of the, uh, the park. I'll just wait and see. The other thing that bothers me is, in a, you know, I'm also in the real estate business, and it's kind of a cutthroat business, but how many people are aware that Boji spirited away the Ford Clinic away from Burton Katzman at 6th and Main. It, it just, that's not the way I do business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrison. Pastor Eric. How you doing? Eric Barr. Um, I'm at 123 and 119 Main Street. Uh, me and my brothers own Toyology Toys. Uh, we're very proud to be uh, retailers here in the downtown district. And uh, first, even before I get into why I'm up here today, I want to let everybody in the room know that during the entire Rethink uh, Royal Oak project, our business has been up 22%. Uh, and uh, we value the changes that the city of Royal Oak is continuing to make so that our business can, can continue to move forward and strive forward here in, our bit, in, in today's time. Uh, the other reason I'm here today is for item number 17 on the list. 
Um, being somebody who comes from a, a family who is focused on health, wellness, and education, my family owned two large premier pharmacies, uh, Save More Pharmacy stores in the, in the area growing up. Um, we've been focused on education our entire lives. Uh, in 2014, we actually sold our pharmacy business to Walgreens uh, to focus on our toy efforts. And since then, we've opened four more locations here in the Metro Detroit area, and we have continued to be successful. All of this has been happening from our offices in downtown Royal Oak. And again, we thank the commission and thank the city for all their continued support. We have also built an amazing wholesale business downtown here in Royal Oak. We support and supply over 4,000 other toy and gift retailers across the country with trend initiative product all year round. Which again, brings me to my next point, education. To the other man's point, I believe that us as citizens of the city have every right to deserve that town hall so we can come and speak our values and speak our minds about what we need as a community. We have also been pre-qualified by the state for our entity Quality Roots. We have not entered into negotiations with any other municipality because we are focused on where we are at home, and that is the city of Royal Oak. <coughs> when it comes to those education platforms, we would be more than honored to represent the city and the citizens at this town hall to bring industry professionals from the real estate side to the tax side, just any part of the industry, so we can give you guys as much education as you guys need to make the most valuable, educated decisions for the citizens of Royal Oak. And I hope we can have that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Is that Ms. Hennessy I see back there? I Good evening, Carol Hennessy, 258 East 12 My Road, Royal Oak. Um, my first thought here is about the police building. No matter what's going on across the street, the police building should be the first priority. Um, I know there are some difficulties and going to be some delays, but whatever can be done to get the police building done first, it should be done first. Um, there's too many problems at the old building that need to be taken care of, and the police need that building. Secondly, I, I don't know why the City Hall has to take up all this land here on Troy. Um, I don't know if there's room to attach it to um, the police building to save money and parking, or to build the city hall on top of a parking deck, of a one-story parking deck, so it would leave more parking, um, street-level parking for uh, farmer's market and for everyone else. Um, then I have to talk about the fruit trucks. I don't believe we need them, especially now. With all the construction going on and no parking, the restaurants are hurting and their sales are down. If you want to do something about the food trucks, don't do it until after all the construction is done and see if we really need them. Having the, fruit, fruit, the food truck rally at the farmer's market is enough for now. And all the talk about the Civic Center Park shouldn't be happening right now until Henry Ford Building is completely designed. Um, we don't know how much land they're going to need to be able to comply with the handicapped spots and valet. I don't believe there's enough room on 2nd Street to have valet for that big of a building and all that's going to be needed. So I hope you take that into consideration when you vote today. Thank you. Dan in the back there. Not very good lighting. Wagman. Somebody lost something. Janice Wagman, 600 Wellesley. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my fellow members of Royal Oakers for Accountability and Responsibility, or ROAR. Thank you for opening your wallets, delivering flyers, working together to provide insight to as much of the community as possible regarding the two ballot proposals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unlike the other committee, we didn't use the support of unions, 
political parties, transit organizations, developers, and hospitals. We didn't use robocalls and surveys. It was just us, a nonpartisan group of Royal Oak residents who trusted the voters to make good decisions. To the voters who supported us at fundraisers, knocked on my door, displayed our signs, and sent heartfelt thanks for what we had done, we thank you. And thank you to all the voters who defeated the sidewalk and transit issues on the ballot. Going forward with regards to transit, let's focus on improving services for seniors where there's a need and without raising taxes. To the commission majority, this is a prime example of you listening to your group of supporters and handpicked task force members to the exclusion of the remainder of the community and those you deem to be too political. You not only put unvetted issues on the ballot, but spent $10,000 of, $10, of our taxpayer dollars to send out an, an explanatory letter. That $10,000 should have been spent on a well-designed survey and mailed to the voters before this issue ever hit the ballot. Despite being uncomfortable, I'm nervous, <clears throat> speaking in public, many of us have stood before you for the allotted three minutes to voice our opinions. I've spoken many times about the loss of parking at Farmer's Market and reported inaccurate numbers and been ignored. And now I've seen a video on YouTube by Take Back Royal Oak showing a piece of paper that was reportedly found in the student drop-off area at Keller Elementary and written by one of you. It obviously was written during an October commission meeting when members of our group spoke to you, our representatives. I don't know who wrote it. I have my suspicions. However, it does represent the attitude I and other voters believe you exhibit. You allow us to speak. But basically, quoting from the note, selections from the notes, the comments were, our comments are blah, 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 or we're morons, or we're not very smart. And the most egregious comment, report roar to the IRS, our group. Seriously? report a citizen's group to the IRS for disagreeing with you. In the future, for the sake of the city of Royal Oak, I suggest your note-taking change from demeaning comments and retaliatory actions to something like reach out to this citizen or this citizen's group for more than three minutes to see how we can work together. Put partisan politics aside and focus on the residents. We did. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Who's next? Michael Willard, 3003 Maplewood. It has come to my attention that there is going to be additional development to be built in Royal Oak, uh, specifically on a historic site that has special meaning to Royal Oak as well as Native Americans. The proposed development of medical facility on the Almond Star House grounds is not necessary and unwarranted. Recently, Royal Oak broke ground a new $60 million city center, which at the moment will house a multi-level medical center as to be determined. Royal Oak already has one of the largest hospitals in Michigan and multiple other medical facilities and offices scattered throughout the city. What the city has failed to realize is Royal Oak's roots. People adored Royal Oak because of, of its affordable housing, diverse downtown, abundant trees, and countless parks and open spaces. Over the past five years, there has been a big push by developers to build houses that take up the entire lot, purchase open spaces, and other city-owned land for pennies on the dollar. In doing so, Hundreds, if not thousands, of mature trees have been removed and not replaced. The once independent small business downtown has been sold out to large corporate entities that have sucked the life out of the community vibe that once was. It has been replaced with a tall, dark structures with either high-end housing or establishments that cater to the wealthy. Royal Oak used to be a town for everyone. Simply put, Royal Oak has lost its identity in trying to follow in the footsteps of Birmingham and certain parts of Detroit. It is understood the city will change over time, and there is going to be development. The city needs to pump its brakes a bit and figure out what current residents and future generations value and are in need of. If the city continues to be pawns and benefactors of developers, it is foreseen in the next de decade where looks future will be bleak. It will be full of large, empty buildings and homes that no one wants and can afford. I'm urging the city and commission to put a stop to the nonsense. Thank you. 
Just, just so you know, Mr. Rowland, we did pass an ordinance that if developers do come with a PUD and they have to remove trees, we will require that they don't. And if it's absolutely necessary, they have to plan them back two to one. And we spent over $500,000 replacing trees. So we do have a program in place. It might not have jumped in in the last five years, but definitely the last two years we've uh, really addressed the so tree planting. So there's a big house that was built on my street, and they tore down a, house, a tree and it hasn't been replaced yet. Yeah, on private property, that's a challenge. Residential, it's not. Private. It's the city's problem. It's an easement. But we replaced those trees. Well, it hasn't been replaced yet. Okay, who's next? Yes, ma'am. My name is Linda Tumala. I live at 3021 Helen Court. I'm going to address the same issue the gentleman just did, which is item 7, I believe. I'm speaking tonight to alert Royal Oak citizens to the possible change in the usage of the historic Almond Star property on Crooks Road to an assisted living memory care facility. When the property was purchased by the present owners in 1992, there was a clause in the purchase agreement that any change to the property or the topography of the lot shall be subject to the approval of the Royal Oak Historical Commission. At the October 24th meeting, when Mr. Seltzer spoke with the Historic Commission, there was a re resolution passed which would allow him to proceed with plans for a two-story building for an assisted living and memory care use. It was not an unanimous vote. No place in the resolution does it mention the Saginaw Trail or how it will be protected. This, to our knowledge, is the last remaining part of the Saginaw Trail. No place does it provide to keep the Star House as it is. And it only indicates the footprint of the home. No place does it mention the huge pine tree at the back of the property, which was a trail marker. This is a significant tree on the property, both in size and history. If you have not seen it, this is a very poor picture, but it is a very, very large tree. Since he stated that the present site plan is conceptual only, we are asking that the park can be worked so that the tree can be saved. It would also add visually to a site where the majority of the trees and vegetation will be removed for the building. The other significant tree on the property is a pin oak, which was planted by the children of the American Revolution in 1939 to mark the trail. The plaque on the stone that's presently there that marks the trail mentions this pin oak. With some creative architecture and planning, these could be saved. Item 7 on the resolutions refers to Mr. Seltzer proceeding to have the house designated as a historic district. As this is a long process, I would like the city to request that this be started no later than 90 days after he closes on the property, rather than waiting until a construction permit is issued, which could be six months or more. The other major concern is the amount of traffic this will generate in a residential area. Besides visitors, there will be service trucks, supply trucks, ambulances, and garbage trucks. With their present plan, again, this was conceptual, so it could be changed. All of this traffic would be exiting on Essex, which is a small side street with a short length from the drive to Crooks. As residents living in the condos directly across the street, we would find this unacceptable to the residential character of the neighborhood. We ask you to delay any action on this item until all issues are resolved. Thank you. Hey, Mr. All right, who's next tonight? There isn't. It's just information. Going once, going twice. All right, we're gonna close public hearing. We're gonna bring the meeting back up to here. Uh, public uh, comment, rather. We will have a uh, public hearing uh, for item number 10 for those who are here to speak on that this evening. Um, this brings us to the approval of the agenda number 8. Commissioner Douglas? Move to approve. A motion by Commissioner Douglas, a second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? 
With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. We have an agenda. This brings us to item number nine of the consent agenda. Uh, are there any, um, anybody want to remove anything from the consent agenda? Anyone want to make a motion on the consent agenda? Commissioner Perush? I move approval of the consent agenda. A motion by Commissioner Perush. We have a second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? I just had a question about one of the items on the consent agenda. It was the purchase order um, listing $540,000 of vehicles. For what department are those vehicles for? Is that police? It's the bottom one. 13 new vehicles. 13 new vehicles, yes. Thank you, Commissioner Macy. Whether they're yours or we're not, we don't have 13 new vehicles total, but it, I mean, I'll pull it up and look for you. We had, uh, I think we might have had five on the budget this year. I don't recall the exact amount. But these are for police vehicles. Well, I'm going to have to look at them. I, Which item number is this, Commissioner? Uh, this it, purchase it, order. Under it's the purchase agenda. order. It's uh, I'm sorry, point of order. We have a motion on the table to approve the consent agenda. There was We wanted to discuss something. We needed to pull it off the agenda. But you've got a motion on the table. I think we can get the question answered real quick. I don't have an issue with getting the question answered. It's come up and it's not coming up for me. I'm sure it's I, just I can't into it to see um, DPS orders the vehicles. We had a number of vehicles that are approved in the budget. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly how many. Not 13. I would guess um, there are other, other vehicles. For, they, our police vehicles are likely included in that, but I can't say for certain. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, Mr. Schultz, just uh, uh, to answer uh, Commissioner Gibbs' question, it, were this not something that we had approved in, in, in the budget uh, earlier? Well, these are definitely all in the budget. They right. are definitely all This bid. would have come with a budget amendment if it was an unplanned for expenses. These are all vehicles that were approved in the annual budget. I realize that. Thank you for pointing it out. I just had a question as to where they were going. I, I can offer to send you an, a, a review of that by email. I appreciate it. I can't that. bring it up right now for some reason. It's not. I understand. Out. Thank you. So it gives us a consent agenda with claims from October 26th, November 6th, November 9th, 2018. Approval of purchase orders. Proclamation designating November 15th, 2018, World Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Day. Approval of special event permit, Small Business Saturday. Approval of special event permit, 360 event productions, Royal Oak Holiday Glow. Approval of recycling use agreement, J.H. Hart, Urban Forestry, Standard Resolution 2, Special Assessment Paving of Masoida Avenue, or Road, rather. Grant of easement for public water main at 5140 Coolidge Highway. Grant of easement for stormwater detention facilities at 1210 North Campbell. And receive and fi file the non-action items, which this uh, week include October 2018 investment report, assign and unassigned fund balance, 2018 sidewalk and road construction update, and the 2018 third quarter training evaluation forms. Any other further discussion? If not, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, this brings us to item number 10, the public hearing zoning ordinance amendments for food trucks. Mr. Gillum, do you want to kick us off here again on this? Well, I see Mr. Johnson on here, and I see Mr. Twing is here. Okay, maybe Mr. Twing. Uh, well, you should have in your commission packet um, the same letter that was presented at first reading. Um, the commission decided to hold a public hearing on the text amendment uh, pr prior to proceeding to second reading, so I don't have a... Uh, another overview to provide that was provided at uh, first reading. Uh, if there are questions uh, after the public hearing or direction, I'll be happy to uh, do it at that point, but I wasn't planning on speaking again. Any questions for Mr. Twing at this point that we didn't get answered last time? Commissioner Macy. Could, I mean, I understand that we discussed this last time, but for the benefit of the people who are here, could you please summarize again why we're here and what the public hearing is about? Um, the proposed text amendment dealing with food trucks um, is, I guess I'll start with the background. 
uh, we have a provision in the zoning ordinance dealing with what's called transient merchants. Transient merchants are allowed in certain zoning districts of the city. They are not allowed in the central business district, basically the downtown area from roughly 11 mile to Lincoln West to uh, Knowles as the CBD or the central business district. No transient merchants are allowed in that area. Transient merchants are seasonal uh, type businesses, uh, flower sales that might be outside, um, uh, things like that. The, uh, at the direction, uh, uh, staff was asked to separate and allow food trucks under uh, special land use and certain criteria. Uh, so the text amendment did, did a couple things. It redefined uh, transient merchants and it took food trucks out of that and defined them as well. And then it established or potentially is going to establish uh, criteria for allowing uh, food trucks as a special land use in the central business district um, uh, related to that criteria. There are several criteria identified in the uh, proposed text amendments that the site would have to comply with or get variances from uh, prior to establishing uh, food trucks uh, in the CBD. Uh, so the Planning Commission uh, looked at the uh, text amendments. Uh, the Planning Commission actually recommended on a three to two vote against uh, the amendment uh, and is recommending that the City Commission follow suit and, and uh, uh, not adopt the uh, uh, text amendment. Uh, Planning Commission also asked several other organizations in the downtown area to provide input, those being the Downtown Development Authority, uh, the Restaurant Association and Chamber of Commerce, and I believe you have copies of their communications to you. Again, all three um, recommending or opposing the text amendment. Uh, staff did receive uh, several individual emails and communications uh, over a time period, and those were provided to the Planning Commission as well. Um, several of those ind individuals were supportive of the uh, text amendment as well as a couple uh, individual business owners that are interested in the uh, establishing uh, food trucks in the CBD. Uh, I wasn't planning on walking through the entire tax amendment, uh, if there's questions on it, but basically that's an outline of, of the changes. Thank you. Yeah, the Commissioner Perush. I have, a, I have a couple of questions about the text amendment itself. Um, at the beginning, it defines temporary or transient outdoor sales as commercial activities conducted outside of an enclosed building on a non-permanent basis, including but not limited to the following retail sales of Christmas trees, flowers and plants, fruits and vegetables, fireworks, pumpkins, uh, other seasonal merchandise, carnival rides, and then food trucks are thrown in there as well. I can understand characterizing all of those other things as temporary or transient because they are definitely seasonal things. You're not gonna be selling flowers in January. But on the other hand, I don't know what in this particular definition would prohibit a food truck from being parked at a specific location 365 days of the year. Am I missing something here or does this really allow, given the way it's defined, a food truck to sit on a specific location, what essentially would be permanently? Well, there are two different definitions uh, here. One, one of the definitions is for food trucks, which is above uh, the temporary or transient merchant outdoor sales. Right. Again, part of the purpose was to, under the, under the current ordinance as it sets, transient merchants are, con or food trucks are considered part of transient merchants. Um, anything that can come and go on a, on a regular basis, a wheeled vehicle, uh, whether it be a, a window shield repair operation where they bring a van in and take your window out, uh, and some of those have been out at the Myers lot, some other things, have gone through an approval process to have that transient merchant. So um, it's really something that can come and go on a, either a seasonal basis or a a regular basis. They go through site plan approval. Uh, the Planning Commission gives them a special land use approval if, if that's the case. And then they can do it on a regular basis without seeking 
any other city approvals um, from the zoning ordinance. They can run it three months out of the year or they can run it nine months out of the year. It can switch from pumpkin sales to flower sales to Christmas tree sales uh, if, if that's what they so choose. So it's establishing that something that they can do temporarily. It's not in an enclosed building. Uh, food trucks are not in an enclosed building. They're not considered a structure. Uh, they're on wheels. Uh, so that's how it fell under there. What we were attempting to do is take food trucks out of that definition and establish another one for them so we could potentially add them to the central business district without allowing all of the other transient merchants. Okay, but when I look at the definition of food truck, it says a kitchen within a licensed and operable motor vehicle or trailer, we all know what that looks like, whose method of operation is temporary and may be transient or in a static location and involves the preparation and sale of food, yada, yada. So it, I don't think there's anything in this food truck definition either which suggests that the truck is only temporary. There's nothing in here that's going to pro that there's I bottom line is I don't see anything in these ordinance amendments that requires the food truck location on a specific site to be temporary. That it that it can only be there for 6 weeks, 6 months, 6 days, whatever. I think the way the ordinance is written, I think effectively a food truck could park at a specific location and stay there. 365 days of the year ad infinitum. I don't think there's actually anything that says it has to be transient and it's limited to, to only a specific period of time that is granted when the special <coughs> use permit is given. You're correct. The fact is, but it could leave if it wanted to and it can come back when it wants to. There is nothing that says it can only be there six months or three months or Twelve months out of the year. So effectively, if, if, if a it's specific cold out or it's warm out, and they want to run a food truck, they will be able to. Okay, but effectively, if a, a specific food truck or a specific business wanted a, a specific food truck to park on their parking lot, uh, you know, until we tell you to go away, they could. There's nothing that makes the food truck transient. It could stay there as long as the business owner was willing to have it there transient in the term that it can move and move when it wants to. The but, city's not but it doesn't have requiring to it to, to move. Okay. Okay. Unless we required that during a plan of operation change or when it came for approval. Or through the and, special and, use and process. Please, if you want to amend the definition or change the, change the wording here, this is your opportunity to change wording. So if you want to clarify or add provisions, change provisions. That's the purpose of first and second readings. I guess, well, we're getting now into the, you know, what we as a commission want to do here, and maybe that's most appropriate after the public hearing. Um, but I just wanted to, to make sure that I wasn't missing something in the wording of the ordinance that is there that would restrict the length of time that a food truck could park at a specific location, and apparently there isn't. So. Um, that was my primary question. Thanks. Any other questions before we open up the public hearing? Well, well if I can add, I mean, this, again, procedurally, if this ordinance is adopted, each, each food truck or transient merchant that's a new one has to submit an application for special land use permit as well as a site plan for the property they want to establish that operation on. Both of those activities will go to the Planning Commission for review and approval. The Planning Commission would either approve the special land use or reject it. Um, and then they can reject it based on either not compliance with specific criteria or there are some subjective standards that they can articulate that it's not an appropriate location and so on. They can also impose conditions and one of those conditions depending on the type of the use may be that you can only operate six months out of the year uh, again I it's not an ordinance provision but it is something that could on a case-by-case -case basis occur at the Planning Commission and then based on that it also review the site plan and approve it 
so that it can reopen and reestablish or run at the same location based on that site plan. Where are they parking? Where where are their employees parking? What's the impact on the site? All this does in terms of an ordinance amendment is give someone the opportunity to make that application. It doesn't say it's going to occur. Uh, the Planning Commission in the review may turn down every see every request for a food truck that comes before them for some reason. There's, this doesn't make it say that one of them is going to happen. Okay. Then I have a follow-up question. Well, and, and it's and it's the property owner that makes the application, that makes the, the request for a special land use. It's not the food truck person. Well, it can either be the, a leaseholder. If you have a lease to use the property for a food truck operation, you can apply. Um, so there may be situations where you have a property owner that's, that meets the criteria and he's going to allow someone to apply to establish food trucks on his property. Obviously, he's going to have to have a, uh, a sign off from the property owner or submit a copy of the lease that says they have property rights to run a food truck on this site. Okay. And then in the past when we've talked about special land use permits on a completely different issue, we've talked about them in terms of, of creating a, a property right that the city really can't take away um, without uh, uh, compensation or maybe can't take away at all. Is that still going to be, I'm looking at the city attorney with this question, is this potentially an issue with this? Um, as opposed to a license agreement, which we can just end when we want to end it. If, if you're granted a special land use permit, is that something that is a property right in this instant as well, which is that much more difficult to take away? <clears throat> well, it would be a limited property right in the sense that you would have to continue to comply with any conditions on the special land use in order to be able to continue to obtain that benefit or to operate the special land use, if you will. Right. And again, depending upon the circumstances of the application, I think uh, it would be possible for the Planning Commission to put a time limit on the special land use or make it subject to review after a period of time as well. So I don't think we're necessarily talking about vested property rights. Okay. But there were, certainly would be some property rights that would be involved. Okay. But you think there would be an opportunity for the Planning Commission, as you say, to put time limits on it, you know, subject to review and three years or at the end of the summer or whatever, um, I think are, would, as long as they're reasonable? I think that would be a reasonable exercise of discretion by the Planning Commission, yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Same rules apply as due for public is comment. Is there anyone here to speak tonight? Yeah, right. Okay. On this ordinance? It hasn't changed. Okay. No, it hasn't changed. Mr. Cotraro? I just... Commissioner, Chief, good evening. Luigi Cutraro, 415 South Washington. Um, I was hoping Channel 7 would have been over here, but unfortunately they left. Um, the reason why I come in tonight is um, I've been on this great city for a, over 30 years, okay? And um, the last couple of months, just, that's, what, that, that's the reason why I'm here tonight. I mean, there's been such a negativity. Um, I watch Channel 7 today, they say we got a controversy. Controversy about what? I mean, what's a controversy that now, if I have a private property, forget about the kitchen, I can bring a food truck. So I don't have nothing against food trucks. I hope my kids don't eat on those trucks, but I don't know, I mean, it's a business. I mean, a young man who wanna start the business, let him be, I mean, that's no problem. But the thing is, it, is are, you, are we talking about me having a property in Royal Oak and just have a building and just let a food trucks come in and say, oh, that's what we're talking about right now, okay? Um, but most of all, it's like, you know, I, I, I hear a young gentleman over there say the same thing. This city was built as small business, small businesses, okay? Now, what does, what, what are possible a food trucks who will bring in this city, including, uh, what, 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 is, what they got to offer? I mean, hamburgers, 
I mean, I challenge I challenge this body to give me one items. The business in Royal Log don't have it. They will, you will not find one item. Whatever the, the trucks, those food trucks will bring in, we got 10 of them. Okay. Royal Oak, despite what the media, what everybody says, doing well. I'm doing well. I love Royal Oak. I got this one from a very famous movie. Royal Oak was a great city 30 years ago. And I still think it's a great city today. Okay. But things, stuff like that. We got one of, there's more crane going on in Royal Oak than I've ever seen in the last 30 years. And what, and what I hear on the media, a Taco Bell Cantina Guana, uh, Guana liquor license. Are you kidding me? Now we got to, I mean, I, this is, I mean, there, there's been three, for what I understand, the Chamber of Commerce, the, the Restaurant Association, which I, we had a meeting. I'm, I'm speaking also, not for the Restaurant Association, I might be up. But you know, everybody's against it. I mean, we are a stakeholder in this city. I mean, 30 years ago, you know, and I know you, you got your constituencies, but you know what, the reality is 30 years ago, Royal Oak was not what it is today. You wouldn't have paid $300,000 for a 1,500 square foot home, okay? That's what's happened in Royal Oak, you know why? I mean, you guys know why? Because we got the most beautiful downtown in Michigan. Okay, downtown is what create. Downtown, when I moved over here 30 years ago, the cheapest real estate was downtown. No one wanna be in downtown Royal Oak. You can buy some of those eyes for almost nothing. Okay, and look what happened now. They building million dollar condos. Are you kidding me? There must be, there's, there's no secret. I mean, the reality is that people like me, people like those restaurants, they work very hard to get where we're at. We do Mr. not Charo, deserve- I do need you to finish up your last point. I'm sorry. Yeah. But my, point, my, my point is I wish there would be another way. This gentleman, who's bringing these food trucks, I'm pretty sure he's a hardworking man like I am, okay? But I think there is enough restaurants over here. There is enough businesses, okay, that we probably can handle their food needs. We want the business. There's no bad business. Every business who come in Royal Oak is a business. But I think by doing that, we gotta open a big can of worm that we don't need anymore in Royal Oak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cataro. Who's next? Anybody else here to speak? Oh, I see a hand back there. Good evening. My name is Tanya Lockwood. I'm a longtime Royal Oak resident and co-owner of Motor City Gas. I'm here today to support the amended food truck ordinance. I believe the freedom to partner and collaborate with food trucks on private property and in a very limited fashion is a very important step for our downtown to keep stride with other progressive cities. When fewer people visit our downtown, it's not one industry that suffers, all of our businesses suffer. We want Royal Oak restaurants to thrive. Our business is not in competition with them. When they do well, we do well. Our competition are other rapidly evolving neighborhood communities that look to steal excitement and foot traffic from our downtown. We want to focus on our core, and that is making whiskey. We do not want to stray from this focus and build a kitchen. By focusing on our core, we will be able to enter into statewide retail distribution and s sell bottles by the name of Royal Oak Rye and Oaktown Brown throughout the state. The inability to use the very property that we own to collaborate with these vendors also puts us at a disadvantage with other craft distilleries in communities like Ferndale, Detroit, and Ann Arbor. This is an important endeavor for us and one that cannot wait. Protectionism will not get people excited about our downtown. We should be encouraging current and aspiring entrepreneurs to come to our city. We should be making it easier, not harder, for them to do business here. Royal Oak should be a fearless and progressive town that fosters new ideas, encourages creative thinking, and welcomes craftsmen and women of all trades. Food trucks are not the answer to all our problems, but making our downtown more artisan-friendly is, is a small step in the right direction. 
Our focus from day one has been to help to grow Royal Oak. We spend a significant amount of time and resources on the goal of bringing new people to our downtown. Commissioners, today we ask for your help in amending some outdated regulations that will allow us to do an even better job at accomplishing that. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ms. Lockwood. <sighs> Mr. Allison. Thank you for that welcome, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really wasn't going to speak about this, but it, it, it is, a, is a colleague of mine in that Charles, commission. Ellison, we do need your name and address for the record. Um, of all people, you should let me ask my rule, wife. What my, name <laughs> my name is Jim Ellison. I live at 1309 Mohawk. I'm a former mayor of this community. Sat there for 13 years, and I'm now tinkering in, in state government. But that's that's neither <laughs> here nor there. As one of our former colleagues up there, Terry Dragwang, always used to say, "We're all thinking ourselves." Okay, what we have is a situation where we, we, we as, and me as part of that, we welcomed these businesses like the breweries that don't have a kitchen, they have a tasting room, the distillery don't have a kitchen, they have a tasting room. And we have benefited as a community from, from those facilities. Those facilities are growing because they make new product and they present new product and they want to have celebrations for new product. And I think that's the intent of what they're trying to do. They're not looking to park a food truck seven days a week outside their business. I think they're looking to bring in a food truck that would, would cater this event that they want to have to unveil this next uh, uh, whiskey they've got or this next new beer they're bringing out. That's, that's my understanding. And if I'm incorrect, then, then forgive me, but I'd be the first one to stand up here and object to wide open food trucks in downtown Royal Oak. That is absolutely unfair to all the brick and mortar businesses. But we went out of our way to welcome the distillery and the brewery into our community. And they have proven to be good citizens and, and, uh, and responsible business owners. What they're looking for is a way to feed their people when they come into their business for these occasional events. That's my understanding. Something occurred to me though um, in this scenario. Okay, so they can't get a food truck, but they can go to Holiday Market and they can cater the event and that food's going to be brought out in a truck and that truck is going to be parked on their property as they bring food into the business. Is that not a food truck? Are we now going to, to, to stymie that enterprise? Because that's another way they could do this. But it sounds like the ordinance would prohibit that from happening as well as prohibit the city's food trucks on Wednesday night because Farmer's Market is within the DDA, the downtown or the central business district. So are we not breaking our own ordinance every time we have a food truck rally at the market? These are just questions that are occurring to me. But again, I think we're all thinking ourselves. I don't know if we have to change the ordinance or we have to change whatever we need to do. We just need to find a way that these businesses, when they have a special event, can accommodate their guests and bring people into their business, which brings people into Royal Oak. I think it's, it's much simpler than what you guys are trying to make it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Yes, I see a hand right there, gentleman in the hat. This is Mr. Rockwood. <coughs> Mayor, commissioners, good evening. My name is Rich Lockwood, uh, 520 South Kenwood. Um, I'm a longtime Royal Oak resident, and along with my wife, Tanya, co-owner of Motor City Gas. Uh, we're here today, obviously, to support the food truck ordinance. Uh, Tanya and I have lived in this city for over 20 years. Uh, we moved here uh, because downtown has always been known as a progressive and forward-thinking city. Uh, I think what we're trying to do here with this ordinance is following in the footsteps of just that. Our goal is to get people into Royal Oak not with regular food service, with a truck parked out there every single day, but through collaborative pop-up style events that brand Royal Oak is innovative, draw customers from out of town, and give residents what they want. These mobile artisans have large followings and, cre and create unique experiences that draw foot traffic from all around. Our doors have always been open to any business and any artisan that's interested in making things together with us. We don't discriminate if those artisans happen to work out of their house or if they happen to work out of a truck. It's time to embrace change. We can be patient and we can wait a year and revisit this and hopefully everything will be better. 
We make whiskey, we understand patience. But we also understand the importance of staying relevant. And when trying to stay relevant, we try to have very little patience. Time is of the essence. Our goal is to be fearless, not scared of changing too fast. The special events permit, unfortunately, is not the answer. The process is labor intensive and has excessive lead times to manage. Some government sources have even told us that we're not allowed to pull special events permits for food trucks. The proposed ordinance changes would allow us to move and adopt more quickly to a rapidly evolving competitive landscape, ultimately making Royal Oak a destination. We can call this twisting an ordinance to benefit a few businesses, or we can call it slightly loosening outdated protectionist regulation that only benefits one industry. It's time to move forward, not next month, not next year, but now. We need to get back to not being scared, to leading, to being Royal Oak. To be Royal Oak, I believe we need to start accepting artisans of all walks, even those who start from grassroots in a quest for the American dream, and who sometimes anchor that dream in the city that accepts them, kind of like us. Mayor, commissioners, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Lockwood. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for holding this public hearing. My name is Samantha Golda. I live at 1500 Owana Avenue. And I've been a part of this community for three years. I just saw you guys were holding this pub public hearing on the news tonight, so I decided to come. Um, prior to living here, I lived in a thriving downtown community of Fort Collins, Colorado, that did allow um, food trucks at breweries. And I loved it. So did my friends. It was a relaxed atmosphere that we could grab a bite to eat, and often we would still go get dinner afterwards. It would be like a snack. So now, being a mother, I look for different unique experiences that might offer a different option than a sit-down meal. And that might be just grabbing a quick bite to eat at a food truck. So then I can pop over to Toyology, where my new friends own their business. Um, and then maybe I want to get a coffee afterwards. But right now, I find myself going to Ferndale, I hop around to different communities like Berkeley, Birmingham, and that's keeping my dollars from downtown. Um, so I think that's it. I just wanted to say I'm, I support the food trucks and I don't own a food truck. I don't own a restaurant downtown. I'm just a local resident here who wants to stay here and have a reason to, and honestly, if there was a pop-up shop of a florist at like a coffee shop, I would love that. I would love to grab a bouquet like while I'm out with my friends or, you know, with my daughter. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Golden. Thanks. Mr. Safaya. Michael Safaya, 5002 Elmhurst Avenue. Um, I'm here tonight in, I want to word this correctly, I'm here tonight in support of Motor City Gas and what they're trying to do. Um, however, I'm not in support of the changing of the ordinance. And I do think that we have the ability to accomplish what we're trying to do, but in a different manner. And I think what is on the table tonight is not the correct way to go about this. Um, they are a great business. They fit well within the city. They're a great complement to everything else that we've going down here. I can't say enough good things about it. Um, they're not the issue. The issue is right here at the table regarding the ordinance. It's not, it really doesn't pertain to them. Um, the changing of the ordinance, um, I don't think we've researched enough what the future negative impact possibly could be with changing an ordinance in this way. Um, my concern is we haven't done enough research into that. Um, you know, not long ago, we didn't have any food trucks in the city. Then we brought them in farmer's market. Now we're introducing them into the downtown. Is it is it fair for businesses to, you know, um, be concerned about what the next step possibly could be down here the road, and I, I don't think that's as unfair for them to have that concern. Um, th this is it's not about this one business, and anybody who called Channel Seven and wanted to 
create a controversy, as has been mentioned here before, um, is just doing a disservice to our city. Um, it, it's not, it doesn't have to be that way. I agree with Mr. Ellison. This is, this is a simple matter and it should be solved very, it can be solved very, very simply. In the Channel 2 News report, there was at least four mentions of um, how they wanted to handle this with special events and, and so forth. And that's why I, I disagree with, I agree with Ms. Lockwood and, and everything and 100% of what everything she said and I kind of disagree with um, Mr. Lockwood about the special event permit. I know our city does a great job with special event. Our police department is top notch at handling special event permits. Um, they are not cumbersome, they are, are not hard to get, and it's not that bad of a process. The city currently has a process right now that if you're a business owner and you want to have a, a dance license, and you all know this, you're granted 12 permits over a period of time, and those permits are used, and if everything goes well, then you give us a license at the end of the, at the, end of the period, okay? Uh, I'll wrap this up in one minute, Mayor. Sure, if you don't mind, thank you. Um, I, the only special event purpose is that I believe, and I won't speak on behalf of the chief here, they do a great job with it. The only ones that are cumbersome are the ones that require road changes and extra staffing and everything else, and that's not the case here. We can, we can accomplish what we're trying to accomplish simply by, maybe this can just be one application, one application with multiple dates on it, and, and that be it. That's, that's the end of the story, and the chief can monitor it. You have, you, this body has final approval process over it. Um, it. It just seems like that's the better route to go. By changing the ordinance, you, as a body, are, are losing control to look at all of these applications on an individual basis. You may like some, like this one, but you may not like the next one. But by, cre by changing the ordinance, your, your power becomes limited. And, and I don't think that that's, I just don't think that's the process that we should go through in this case. Um, there, there, is a, there is another solution, and we have a lot of great people here and in this community, and I, I, I think we can uh, we can get where we want to get to, but not by change, not by this drastic step of changing this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spy. Who's next? Yes, sir. Here on the aisle. Hello, Jason Edberg, 120 North Blair. Uh, before I begin, I. Note that it's painfully obvious that no food truck owners or operators have been engaged or consulted in this process. So I request uh, approximately eight minutes to make my uh, remarks regarding the current ordinance, uh, if that's acceptable. We have to make a motion. Three minutes for a public hearing seems uh, awfully limited, especially when no one has considered the point of view of a uh, food truck owner or operator. Mr. Edberg, we have to get a, a motion by the commission here. And I, I understand. Don't, I don't see one. Commissioner Dubuck? we we'll move for five minutes. A motion by Commissioner Dubuck, I'll second by uh, Commissioner Lavasser. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. Mr. Edberg, Thank five you. Minutes. If we could reset that to five minutes. Um, I, I agree, honestly, with the previous gentleman. I, and I am a food truck owner. Um, I support the Lockwoods and what they're trying to do with their private property. Uh, but the ordinance really is not the answer. Um, it's, it, it just doesn't belong in the zoning ordinance. You know, it's a very awkward attempt to work food trucks into the ordinance. Um, it doesn't read in a very common sense manner, if you, it, you know, for what it's worth. And what we need to do is take advantage of the fact that the ordinance are silent to food trucks so that we can write specific rules and a licensing and permitting process for food trucks. You know, we're making up definitions as we go along. Uh, you mentioned the, that definition of food truck and how that's handled in the rewrite. Um, everything we need to define food trucks is already in state and county regulations. We don't need to make up new definitions uh, to avoid classifying food trucks with another set of vendors. Um, everything is there from the county health department and from the, the state uh, regulations. 
What we do need to do is develop a separate license and permit process with the limitations that you would re renew every year. Troy does it, Hamtramck does it, Rochester Hills does it. They all have a peddler's license that uh, food trucks apply to. You don't have to worry about ordinances. You don't have to worry about grandfathering in property use. You don't have to worry about bad actors. You can simply just not renew the license for the next year. Um, restricting food, light, food trucks on private property like the Lockwoods is just an overreach and, and it's discriminatory against those businesses. Uh, on another note, precedent exists for regular use of public property for financial gain. We allow bag meters for valet parking. None of those are charities. Those are for-profit companies. Uh, we, have, we allow sidewalk cafe seating for for-profit enterprise. And denying food trucks equitable access to public property is also discriminatory. So one last thing I wanna bring up is about proportionality. Okay, my food truck business in a year will do less than $50,000 in sales. Okay, so to think that my business is somehow a threat to the Royal Oak Downtown Restaurant Association is laughable. Okay, the Lockwoods venue seats 40 people. How much money do you think a food truck makes in a night at a venue that seats only 40 people? And, and only a small percentage of those people actually purchase food. What we need to do is to consider that each restaurant, percentage of their sales goes to the landlord is only about six to 8%. Only a small portion of that money goes to the city as revenue. So when you look at an actual brick and mortar restaurant, only one to 2% of their sales for a given year end up as city revenue. Food trucks would gladly pay 10 to 15% of their revenue for use of public space in the downtown area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. Okay, Mr. Karate, I see you back there. Mr. Mayor, Commission, Chief. Um, I wasn't going to speak tonight either, but after listening to everyone, I want to just say what I think. Uh, I think there's an easy solution Mr. also. Karate, can you get your name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. John Karate, Rock on 3rd, um, 112 East 3rd Street. I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Rock. I'm here speaking on behalf of Unity for Royal Oak. I think we can achieve what we're trying to here by giving this gentleman several special event permits and say he did 12 of them. It's $1,500 investment. That would be a decent sample size to see if this even works. If it works, then he could continue to do it. If it doesn't, then why are we changing an ordinance for the whole city? If it worked and he wanted to do 24, it's $3,000. I paid $1,500 a year to park my car to come down here to do business. So I just think that he is a great business owner. I love his place. But I think that if you give him an opportunity to use this truck and go out there and see if it makes sense then we start putting some time and effort into maybe doing something. But right now, there's an easy solution in front of us. The special event permit, we pull several of them a year, and they're a very easy process. So I think there's an easier solution, as Mike Safai alluded to. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Karate. Anybody else here to speak tonight? Yes, sir. Mayor, Commission, uh, Mike Mazur, 803 Orchard View. Uh, I don't have a speech. I don't have anything eloquently prepared. I'm just here to speak on behalf of a friend and a small business owner. Uh, you guys are very well educated. You know your city politics. I challenge you to find a way to let a food truck come into this city. You already do it at the uh, farmer's market. It's very confusing to understand how you can allow that to be had and see success and have your research in place, but you're limiting it now to a small business owner. He's not asking for it to be outside of his business 365 days a year. He's asking for a couple days a week, if that. I don't even know what his plan is. It also is a small business that was just named one of the top 25 in the country for what he does. I think you ought to embrace the business and find ways that you can help him as a small business owner. You say it a lot. You put it a lot in your postcards every two, every four years. Now's your time to prove your point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mazur. Who's next? 
Yes, sir, in the back. Is that Ed? It is. So I've seen Jack. <laughs> I broke off Jack. <laughs> Edward Stencil, uh, 111 North Main Street, um, Unit 311. I'm also the owner, uh, co-owner, I should say, of uh, River Rouge Brewing Company, uh, located across uh, from Motor City Gas on 4th Street, East 4th Street. And um, I think uh, the discussion about food trucks and what people perceive them to be to small businesses that are breweries and distilleries, aren't. it hasn't really been uh, realized, the discussion. I don't think people quite get what they do. Let me put it in, in this type of perspective. When you go into a restaurant or a uh, business here on Main Street or any of the other locations downtown, and they're doing an event with, say, Founders or Bells, they do that event to drive business. And it's a special event, and they bring special beers, and that drives their kitchen, it drives their, their uh, beer business, and it's something they use to uh, help them, you know, uh, survive, pay rent, and uh, thrive as a business. That's what a food truck does for a distillery or a brewery. It's an event. It's something special. It brings people to the establishment uh, to drink their, uh, the beer, the, the whiskey, whatever the products are that, uh, that we're moving. Um, it's, it's supplementary, and it, uh, it's not something that's an everyday thing. It's a, uh, it's a special event. It's a once a month, once a every, uh, I mean, you could do it once a month, twice a month. It's not something you do seven days a week because then it's no longer special and then it doesn't really make it an event. And I think that's something that uh, if you look at places that use food trucks in other communities, a lot of the times that's what they do. I, I mean, it's, it's a standard uh, practice and way of doing business for people that, that have breweries and distilleries and wineries and, and businesses like that. Uh, and uh, I don't think... The way it's being discussed here, it's being uh, that people are thinking about uh, thinking about it in that manner. That it's it's a promotional thing. It's like I said, it's like founders coming. It's like bells or or uh, roke or somebody doing an event at, at your restaurant. Well, we use food that way, and you and you're not really seeing it like that. And I, I think that's a perspective that I wanted to uh, to bring up. And I hope you uh, find a way to make something work here in Royal Oak for us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stencil. Anybody else here to speak tonight at this public hearing? Going once, going twice. All right, we're going to close the public hearing, bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. Questions? Discussion? Commissioner Macy. Uh, I have a question that I think is probably for the chief, actually. Um, is special event permit, does it, is it 125 per day? It's 125 per permit. So if it's like a three-day event, that's still 125? Well, we have guidelines, but they're not hard and fast rules. So special events are special, so we would evaluate them. Something like this we could do in one permit for multiple dates. Okay, okay so like the dance permits that were discussed where there's 12? The, well, the, where the 12 came from is... If you don't have a dance permit on your MLCC license, you can get up to 12 a year. Oh, I see. Okay. And that was a kind of a policy we used to do before granting a business a dance permit. I okay. Think that's what he's referring to. Okay. Thank There's you. No limit on special event permits. Commissioner Lavasser. I, I want to follow up with the idea of the special event permit versus this proposed ordinance and just get a feel for what the difference in process would be, what the difference in uh, what we as a community would see if, if we went one direction versus the other, what the difference would be for the applicant if, if it were a special event permit versus proceeding with this ordinance. Well, because they have a liquor license, they have a plan of operation that they have to follow. Nothing in their plan of operation allows for food trucks. So the first special event that they would want would have to come to the city commission for approval. So if what I'm, the tone I'm hearing is if they could put in for multiple dates for a food truck, uh, they could fill out an application for a special event. It would be basically the exact same 
operation, so it would be easy to process. It'd have to have insurance. Um, it's relatively easy for us to write it up. The first approval would come from the city commission. After that, they'd be administratively approved. Um, because they're special events, we could pull them at any time if we recognize there's a problem. We write those into all the special events. Chief, I have a question for you. So maybe you can answer it too, Mr. Twing. But, no, I was um, going to answer Mr. Lavasser's special land use process. Okay, you can follow up with that first. Sorry. Um, as, as I said earlier, there is an application that you'd have to submit uh, through the Planning Commission. The cost of that initial request is $1,500. There is a public hearing required as part of that that goes out 300 feet to all the property owners. They also have to prepare a site plan <coughs> and, and architectural plans that are sealed. So there's an added cost to that that depends on the amount of work and can vary in total cost. Uh, that would get scheduled for the Planning Commission meeting, uh, and generally they act upon those uh, requests at, at a single meeting. Uh, if it's approved, um, once they submit, if they need building permits for any reason, make those adjustments uh, in terms of how uh, they're providing connections, generator, whatever whatever the operational item might be on the site for, for things, um, then they can start operating. As long as they continue to operate in compliance with the approval, they don't need to come back for any further approvals. They don't need permission from the city to run it on a particular Saturday or Friday. Uh, they may have to amend the plan of operation through the police chief and, 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 and that operation because of the liquor license involved. But from a zoning standpoint, they would not need any further approvals as long as they continue to comply. So it sounds to me when we talk about a special event permit versus the ordinance change, the ordinance change would require a lot more work up front and planning up front, approvals by the Planning Commission, um, as well as being limited to um, liquor license serving establishments. Um, Chief, I guess my question is with the special event permit, there's been some discussion, okay, about this idea of getting approval for any particular business uh, for a food truck. And the talk has been about the brewery and distillery perhaps on 4th Street. What would prevent or stop um, from any business, regardless if they have a liquor license, from making the same requests and, you know, the ability to deny, you know, folks, anybody that owns property to put a food truck on if we... They could make a request to do it. And we've had them... I can't recall if we've done it in the CBD. I don't know if we have. I know we've had, like, Yule Saloon did one yep. at one special yeah, event. It came one. to the commission. Well, anyone's eligible to apply for a special yeah. event permit. Right. Anyone can do that. But the approval and denial is up to the discretion of? Well, the police department approves special event permits. Right. From the definition of them, they, on, on the norm, don't comply with zoning ordinance requirements. Right. Um, that's why, that's they're why they're called they're special. <laughs> they, they get operational items that wouldn't be allowed, uh, generally speaking. Um, so that's the biggest difference. But the intent is then the police department has the ability to shut them down. Right, if it's a problem. Right. Correct. From a public safety perspective. From an economic perspective, no, but from a public safety perspective, yes. Uh, yes, it'd be a public safety perspective. Was we shut him down, yeah. Mr. Gibbs. So it would be a total cost of fifteen hundred dollars for the planning commission approval, as well as the hundred and twenty-five dollars for the special events permit. Correct for, and and the fifteen hundred dollars for the planning on a, is a one-time basis. Yeah, the if they go through the. Special land use approval, it's those, okay, that's those approval. There is no special event application okay. other, uh, other than whatever they would need to amend the plan of operation for the liquor license. It, okay. They'd have some costs there that I don't, I'm not aware of. But then they would have plans they would have to have drawn by an architect to seal them. And that would have some cost. It's not a city fee. It's a requirement as part of your submission. But the special, for a special land use permit, that would not be required for a special right. event. Correct. Okay, yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Right, we're talking about two different things. And okay. 
Commissioner Douglas. So if this ordinance change does not is not approved, um, there's they don't need a special, they can't even take advantage of a special land use because it won't be provided for in our existing ordinance, but they would still have access to special events permits, right? Correct. We don't the city under the current ordinance does not allow transient merchants in the central business district. Right. None of them. So by not approving that, I mean, if we approve this ordinance, that means they could, if they so choose, go through the special land use process, $1,500, approval, 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 yada, yada. If we turn down the ordinance, they still have access to special events permits as described by the chief. Correct. Right. Right. Mr. Levasseur. I, I just want to follow up again on, on the question of special events. Is, is there a limit to how often uh, an applicant can... Utilize a special event if, if it's if it's like 365 days. It's not special. Is there a limit in the well? No, there's not a hard and fast limit. Generally, a special event is one day. That's your event. Some are spread out over a number of days, like Arts Beats and Eats, for example. Um, but because they're kind of unique, we, we don't have hard and fast rules. We just kind of evaluate them as they come in. Um, I haven't considered whether or not they wanted a special event that would have it every day of the week. Um, whatever they submitted um, would probably encourage them as let's stick with one month, um, write up a special event for that month, whatever dates they wanted, and would bring it back to the city commission. The city commission would make the first approval. Um, I think we'd have to think about if how many, how often is it to where this isn't really this is their regular plan of operation it's not special I, I I don't know I haven't really thought that through Corey, haven't we done some special event permits for non contiguous time periods yes. particularly for some parking lot sales that only occurred on the weekend yes yes and like I said because they're unique so you can't have hard and fast rules on how we handle these mr. Gillum just to follow up on the chief's comments to Commissioner Lavasser to, to add a little bit more information to your question um, the ordinance talks about events that are outside of the ordinary course of business. So it's not specifically defined in the ordinance, but on the staff level, we'd have to make a determination at some point if something was, in fact, part of the ordinary course of business, it wouldn't be eligible for a special event permit. On the other hand, as long as what was proposed is still outside of the ordinary course of business, they would be eligible to submit an application. And I think that's the biggest... You know, issue I think when you compare the two options is one, I think everybody agrees we don't want to see, you know, immediate proliferation of food trucks in our downtown. We want to, in our central business district, I think there's probably alignment there. We want to see, experiment, understand how, you know, we can do a test. I think with the special event permit process, um, just like Mr. Gillum said, if it becomes of ordinary course of business, it's no longer special. And what do you do then? I think number two, um, specifically when you talk about a special event permit for an individual business or businesses, that's fine. But in the context of a bigger central business district, we're putting a lot of pressure and um, uh, decision making on the police staff to make decisions about where and whom should have food trucks and where they should go. And they'll come in front of this commission over and over and over again. Um, I think the whole premise of this ordinance change was to make sure we had some uh, restrictions that one, we took food trucks out, two, it would apply to liquor serving establishments only, uh, like Mr. Ellison mentioned with the breweries and distilleries being a, a bigger fabric of our community. Um, and also, you know, for, I mean, we always require that folks report what their food to alcohol ratio is when they come up here in front of the table, longstanding tradition. So food has some relevancy, I guess, to the service of alcohol. And we also want to make sure that we keep Royal Oak relevant and ensure that, again, we're not opening up the floodgates to something that we don't quite understand the full impact um, by putting certain restrictions um, within an ordinance. I fear if you go down the special event permit process, at what criteria do we have to deny anybody that has a piece of property in Royal Oak uh, to have food trucks, you know, five times a week, two times a week, whatever it may be. I think we need to, you know, do some planning up front, make sure those who really can use it to benefit the 
entire downtown of Royal Oak go through a process through planning and make sure that the Planning Commission understands the benefit uh, that such a situation would have for the downtown and uh, make those decisions accordingly. But I think it would be a challenge going down the special event. I think it would create to um, a complex situation of proliferation. If, if, if I may, um, you also have a third option. But um, the, the reason the ordinance was drafted was because of the interest to allow it to happen on private property. Um, and so in order for it to occur on private property, it has to be allowed under some provision of zoning ordinance. You do have the ability to allow it to occur in a public right-of-way under a licensing agreement, separate from a special event permit, very similar to what you do do with sidewalk cafes. Um, and that could be done under a, a license agreement on whatever criteria and guidelines you wanted to establish. Unless Mr. Gillum disagrees with me, but we've we've, <laughs> we've allowed a lot of a lot of uh, encroachments in the right of way under license agreement. Far be it for me to disagree with Mr. Twain. So, <laughs> but uh, license agreements then would be subject to approval by the city commission. Ms. Douglas. Uh, yeah. Um, despite the mayor's plea, I'm going to make a motion to uh, reject the proposed changes to the um, uh, uh, ordinance. Motion by uh, Commissioner Douglas. We have a second by Commissioner Dubuck. Can, can I ask, uh, scheduling-wise, we had to schedule for a second reading at a follow-up meeting. I, I just want to make clear you can vote tonight based on how it was posted. Oh, that's right. and I did, I'm sorry, we can or cannot? I'm asking. Oh. I just want to make sure I'm asking. It was posted in that manner because of a request of the city commission when we had first reading. So this is the second reading? No, this is no, meant to be. This is, this is meant reading. to be just Before a public the hearing. Reading. Oh. The second know. reading would occur at another meeting. I'm oh. just asking, ah. Mr. Gillum, what can we? Yeah, technically, this is posted as a public hearing. The anticipation was that, based upon the public hearing, if the ordinance amendment was going to go forward, that there would probably be amendments to the ordinance, and we'd have to put the ordinance into. We'd have to amend the ordinance to bring it back for approval on second reading. So. But that means that we do have the ability to vote on it now if there are no text changes, which there won't be if we're rejecting it. Um, or you can take no action at all, either one. I don't think it's necessary to reject the ordinance amendment as it stands right now. The ordinance doesn't allow for food trucks in the central business district unless the ordinance is changed. The existing ordinance will remain in effect. Oh. So I think you could do either one to answer. But. I withdraw my motion. <laughs> Motion is withdrawn. But well, I was going to speak to the motion. There is that? there there is no motion, which I was what I was thinking. I I don't intend to take action on this item. I think we discussed it uh, last week. I really appreciate all the the input uh, and, and public comment on this tonight. Um, I think it is mischaracterizing to say that there's you know controversy. Like we're having, I think, a robust you know public discussion about <laughs> you know something that. Uh, I think is eventually inevitable uh, in our downtown. And in what we discussed uh, when this was last before us, you know, my issues are, you know, I don't think by any stretch I'd be defined as a protectionist. Um, and even if I were, I don't think that, you know, a food truck competes uh, with, uh, you know, Hopcat. I think they both sell food, but they have very different products. Um, uh, my concern is with with uh, you know, this approach. Uh, I think it's it's spotty. It's not really getting us to where we want to be, which I think is where we have uh, a healthy integration of food trucks into our downtown, um, and we're doing it in a thoughtful way with licensing, as was su suggested, with understanding what's the capacity that that we can handle right now. And and I love Motor City Gas. I love River Rouge, and I want to help them to whatever extent possible. Uh, I, I think that changing you know the ordinance. Um, specifically to address a couple very specific situations is just not a good way to approach public policy. Um, so th that's that's my primary concern. I think that in addition to the fact that you know we have we're going through a tremendous transition in the downtown right now that we discussed, and um, you know it, at, at the end of it, you know a year or so from now, you know there will be 
2,000 plus new daytime workers walking around who I think would certainly create more than enough demand for a thoughtful uh, presence of food trucks that I think could be done in a, a better way than we have before us. So even if we do this, we're going to have to come back and revisit it uh, a year from now, um, you know, given that we're in this kind of, you know, change, period of change. And, and I don't think that's the best way to make uh, decisions. So I think in as much as the special event permit might be uh, clunky for now, it, it works to bridge this gap so that we're not like changing ordinance radically to, to kind of spot fix a couple of very specific situations. So I wasn't going to move on it, but you, you, uh, you know, because I think we can just leave it be unless someone intends to, to move this forward. Mr. Macy. So now I don't understand what happens in the absence of commission action today. We get the ordinance second reading um, next meeting. Okay. Well, if the commission wants us to bring it back. If the commission doesn't want us to bring it back, it won't be brought back for second reading, and we'll have the status quo. We don't have to have a second reading on any no, We don't have to, but we would need commission direction to not bring it back because I have prior commission direction to have it on the next agenda. I'd agree with that. Commissioner Macy? And the public is aware of that, that we said that there were going to be two public hearings on this matter. So there could be people who weren't here tonight wanted, and wanted a chance to be Not here. two public hearings. Well, two public comment and a public hearing. Yeah. Commissioner Douglas. I am going to make a motion. <laughs> Just to be clear, um, that we reject the proposed text amendments um, in the ordinance and uh, therefore uh, cancel the uh, second reading of the ordinance. Motion by Commissioner Douglas, second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion. Commissioner Douglas. What he said, um, um, I, it, I sense that there is a, a willingness on the part of the city administration to work creatively with um, a very creative business. And, uh, you know, I, the, the Lockwoods have got, they, have, they are all in on this. They live here. They've got their money tied up in this business. Um, they've got their hearts and souls there. They're bringing regard to our city. Um, and I, I think I, I sense a willingness on the part of the administration to work with them. They're creative. I think we can be creative within the limits of the law, special events permits, um, licensing, um, in order to help them do something new and different with their business. Um, and let's experiment with it. And if within a year, six months or a year, we were you know, satisfied or enthused about what's going on, other solutions come to us, we have the opportunity to revisit this subject again. Commissioner Prush. I'm going to support the, um, the ordinance as it's been put forward by Commissioner Douglas. I had some problems with this ordinance when it was first presented um, for the reasons that I articulated then. I still think that the wording of it is a little bit... Um, um, awkward in a couple of in a couple of instances. Not that it wasn't well drafted, but I think as the more we re we bleh, it's late, the more we read it and think about it, um, the more uh, uh, issues that we think we want to tweak within the ordinance. And I think giving ourselves a, a period of time where we have. Uh, uh, the use of food trucks on this location and perhaps maybe other locations in the community, although I really can't think of any others that it might apply to, um, it will give us an opportunity in terms of experience. We'll be able to, if we want to, revisit this ordinance issue at a period of time in the future, six months, ne after next summer, whatever, um, we can do that. But I'm really uncomfortable with moving forward with it now, given um, the wording as it occurs uh, right now. I think we need a little bit of experience with the actual types of events that will occur um, under the special event permit uh, format, um, and then we can go forward. But I'm, I really don't want to approve um, a change in the ordinance right now. Commissioner Lavasser. I, I think it's a, a great experiment to, to try, but I suspect that the special event process is probably going to be the better way to go at this time to see exactly how it works for our community, how, how it works. A little less opportunity, I believe, for opening a Pandora's box and having unintended consequences, so I'm going to support this motion. Commissioner Macy. 
So um, one question I have, and I, one of the reasons I'd like to see this, how it go to the second reading is because I feel like this is a new, we discussed this last time and we didn't put it out there and now I, I sort of need time to think and talk about it and hear some get some answers to my questions. Um, but one of them is that it was mentioned that the special events process was cumbersome and then it's been said since then, no, no, piece of cake, you know, you just file this one thing, 125, and then you get as many dates as you want. Um, I, I, that's kind of the sticking point for me. Is there something I'm, I'm not understanding about this special events process, permit process? I don't know if that's something the chief can answer. Or... Sure. The process is only cumbersome if the applicant makes it so. Um, they have to file an application. They have to have insurance. We, we, before we'll review it, we need those things done. Once it's done, I have a sergeant who works with the applicant and nine times out of ten helps them fill out the application and, and coordinates the event. Th these are simple. We do well over 100 special events a year, and they're done. The one on the event on the, uh, the small business Saturday was filed, and it was done by the end of day, that day. So, um, you know, depend on who the applicant is. It, it might be hard, but we're usually waiting on the applicant for things, or they want us to plan their event, and we don't do that. We need them to plan their event, but we'll help them. So, oh, one more question: um, Is there flexibility in the dates of a special event permit? Like, can you say Tuesdays, Thursdays in March, and then if it doesn't, there are Thursdays? because every we, it's such a right. Some are fun runs. Some are. Um, they're very different. Some are very labor intensive. Some are very simple. So some events we'll let them put in for multiple dates. Other events will say no. We need one special event application per date because they're very labor intensive in how either the DPS has to help with them or we have to staff it or something like that. So they're all kind of independently evaluated. I'll say I agree with Commissioner Macy. I think not being able to hold it over. There might have been other people that want to come out and speak to it. Um, you know, the next time we have this on the agenda, as we had planned before, as Commissioner Lavasser had proposed, which seemed good. Um, I think also, too, I mean, just in general, for hanging our hat on the special event permit process, uh, maybe on a temporary perspective, but, you know, I really do question. I, I, I think that you'll get lots of requests coming in through the police department for food trucks and to say no to some and yes to some, I think will be a pretty complicated criteria. That's why we try to articulate them in ordinances. Whereas I understand there's maybe some things in here people don't like. Uh, we still have the ability to uh, make changes to this and send it back for second reading. Um, and I think that uh, you know, um, you know, I don't, I don't think special uh, events permits are, are the way to go. We've also had ordinances up here that we've tweaked over months and years, the construction ordinance. We took a stab at it. We saw how it worked. We got some more feedback. We fixed that ordinance, and now we have a much better uh, construction safety ordinance uh, in our neighborhoods. So I'm not afraid an, an ordinance isn't a constitutional change. Um, you know, it's just a simple vote of the majority here to, to make it work. So um, I won't be supporting the... Uh, the motion. Any other discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. All right. So we will not be having a discussion on this at the next meeting, a second hearing. So um, at this point in time, the ordinance remains as is, and food trucks are prohibited in the central business district. Uh, notwithstanding a special event permit. Okay. This brings us to item number 11, the Historical Commission recommendation on the Almond <coughs> Star House. Mayor Forney and City Commissioners, I see that uh, the agenda reads that this is a recommendation from the Historical Commission, but actually it's probably more appropriate to say that this is an update from the Historical Commission. Um, what's at issue in this particular case is the potential use of the Almond Star property at 3123 Crooks, Crooks Road. This is property that years and years ago was actually owned by the city. Uh, when the city conveyed the property, transferred the property, 
Um, there were a number of deed restrictions, if you will, that were put into place regarding the property. Um, over the years, those uh, um, deed restrictions have been followed by the current owners, but uh, a group of attorneys that uh, are about time to, to call it a day, and the property is for sale now, and so these same covenants and restrictions have become an issue. And in particular, um, again, the, the covenants and restrictions, one of those in particular requires that the Historical Commission grant approval for the addition of any structures to the property and also any changes to the topography of the, of the structure. And so what's been proposed for the structure is the addition of a, an assisted living and memory care facility. Um, the operators or proposed operators have another facility here in town. They would like to add a second one to the southern end of this particular piece of property recognizing that these covenants and restrictions are in place, they approached the Historical Commission to obtain approval for this potential development from the Historical Commission so they could then in turn submit an application to the city for potential site plan approval of their development. The city would not accept any kind of a submission for site plan review until the necessary approvals had been obtained from the Historical Commission. So. The potential buyers of the property went to the Historical Commission. They did obtain approval from the Historical Commission. Candace Isaacson, who is the outgoing chairperson of the Historical Commission, is here. I'll uh, turn the floor over to her, but I do have some other comments, too. Uh, oh. Hi, guys. Back up here. Um, we uh, actually were approached by Marty and Scott Seltzer of the Chesterfield Street residents. They actually own property here in Royal Oak on Chester Street, right across from the high school, the old American house. It is a memory and living care facility. Um, I, we were invited out there. We went and took a tour of their place. Very nice, very clean, no smell, no nothing, very beautiful. Um, to me, the biggest issue with any type of business going on this property is the neighbors and the neighborhood. It is got condos on one side, houses in the back of it, et cetera, et cetera. I went there, I did my due diligence with this. I went there at all times of day and night, weekends, weekdays, checking out their traffic patterns. Right now he has 40 employees on three shifts. It's not a lot of employees for a two-story with a basement memory care facility. Now, you add in the visitors and stuff. I hate to say this. People don't go see their people in their in those facilities like they should. But there was very low traffic. Um, so with that, we had the vote on October 24th. Mr. Gillum was present for that vote. Um, my board voted three in favor, one opposed, one abstained because he knows the owner. So it did pass. I of course don't vote. So I feel it's a gr it's a good blend with this area. It's a quiet senior center, basically. It's locked facilities. It's memory care. They can't be left open doors, et cetera, for their own safety. He will be building an outside terrace. Yes, we have the Indian Trail and the discussion of the pin oak and the rock. Unfortunately, they planted a lovely pin oak, but the roots have taken the trail away. Can't see it. The rock will be moved to the south corner. This is from Mr. Seltzer's own words. He is going to keep the Almond Star as an admin office. It will be separate from the building. It will not be conjoined in any way. Parking would be along the back, and I'm sure Mr. Gillum did pass out the footprint. We voted to approve that footprint. If there's any variances, any changes, anything like that, we do not approve of that. Mr. Twining, <laughs> I sent you a voicemail on that. Um, they would have to come back to the ROHC. We approved a one-time topography change from the start of the project to the end. We also discussed any artifacts, et cetera, et cetera, if they find them in their digging, to either reach out to the ROHC or to the Royal Oak Historical Society. Any questions so far? The tree. The tree is a pine tree. It's a beautiful tree. He is agreeing to try not to disturb it. We're hoping, hoping, hoping it survives with the parking lot, Dick. Anything else? Questions from Ms. Isaacson? 
Where is the, pi sure where is the pine tree? The pine tree is af on the south side of the house, but it's all the way to the back. Okay. Oh. It's a bent tree, what they call the, a Native American bent tree. It points to what was the Red Run River. So, okay, thanks. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. Mr. Gillum, you have some comments after? Just uh, yeah, to, to follow up on, on Ms. Isaacson's comments, um, yeah, um, in, in, as she indicated, Mr. Seltzer indicated he was going to try to save the, the evergreen tree, but to be candid, he indicated that the lower limb was probably going to have to be taken off. Mm -hmm. We're he, hoping didn't, that. He, and he did not think that they would be able to save the tree, but he was going to make the effort to try. So, um, as she indicated, the stone the commemorating the trail would be moved to the south end to the area where the trail is now. He also indicated that in terms of their grading on the site, they would make a small cut in the, in the grading to commemorate the trail. They can't commit to putting that grading in the exact place where the trail is, We're gonna try. where the trail is believed <laughs> to be, but they would make that as part of the landscaping. <coughs> I know that um, um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tumala were at the meeting and um, they, they raised the question of, of traffic at that time. Um, the, um, the site plan, you don't have the full diagram here, but what's been, been proposed is there would be a driveway on the north end of the property um, off of Crooks and then it would go through the property down the west side of the property down to Essex. So it would be a one-way flow of traffic. Um, and we're getting a little bit into site plan issues that can be addressed by the Planning Commission, assuming that the, the proposal goes forward at this point in time. But I think it would clearly be within the, the, um, the authority of the Planning Commission to restrict traffic coming out of the facility from going right on Essex into the residential neighborhood. I think traffic could be restricted to go left back to Crooks Road. So hopefully that would deal uh, with the traffic questions. Um, in terms of the Star House itself, um, in, in speaking with my, Ms. Isaacson and the other comments that the members of the, um, the Historical Commission made, I think it's paramount in everyone's mind that but for the fact that the Historical Commission is allowing this structure potentially to be built and allowing for the related grading that goes along with it. Other than that, all the existing covenants and restrictions on the property will remain in place. So one of the covenants and restrictions is that the exterior of the Star House be maintained as much as possible in its current condition, the same kind of materials. In fact, there's a specific uh, provision in there that if possible even use the original bricks to maintain the exterior. So that would stay in place. In addition to that, um, as indicated in the, the resolution from the Historical Commission, uh, Mr. Seltzer has agreed that within uh, 90 days of the time that he actually obtains his approvals and, issue, and permits are issued for the site, he will make application to the city for the designation of the or the Almond Star House itself, not the entire property, because he's obviously proposing to, to build the facility on the southern end, but the area of the Almond Star House, he would submit the application to have the Star House designated as a historic district. In fact, I talked to Ruth Cleveland about that today, and she looks forward to the time that an application is submitted, because then the process just so everyone's familiar, is in the Historic District Study Committee would conduct a study of the property, the history of the property, its significance, and they would prepare a report. The report goes to the state. The state provides any comments it has. Um, then all that information is conveyed to the City Commission in the form of a recommendation that an ordinance be adopted that would actually designate the Almond Star House as a district. So... Um, it, it, uh, <clears throat> at this point in time, again, there is no formal action that's required of you. Um, if it gets to the point down the road that, uh, that there is going to be a recommendation for the historic district, there will be action to be taken at that point in time. But at this point, um, the Historical Co Commission, is their recommendation has been made, their approval has been given. So Mr. Seltzer intends to submit for site plan approval for the proposal. Um, 
depending upon how quickly they get everything to sub submit it to the planning department, he's indicated to me that they would hope to be on the planning commission agenda in January. So, um, if you have other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. M so, Ms. Isaacson, can you help this commission understand the historical commission's reasoning for? I mean, it seems like if all the covenants are going to follow, at this point, the deeds and covenants are going to follow the star house, the Almond Star House, and it's going to be protected to some extent. Is there a additional benefit from a historical perspective um, that we should be made aware of if this process uh, continues to be continues to unfold? Historical benefit is basically for us as the residents of Royal Oak. Um, for them, there really is no tax deduction anymore. Well, I'm just saying, maybe let me phrase it up. I mean, okay. to me, the way I look at it is currently we have a piece of property there. It's green. It's got trees. It's got the trail. Um, it's something that we're proud of as a community. And that green space is going to be converted into a memory care facility. Um, in exchange for losing that green space, maybe some of those trees and, you know, sort of that uh, special recognition of that trail, how is that enhancing the cause of you know, the residents, everybody from a historical perspective. Well, what we have is the property is owned by a, a person, you know, a personal per mm -hmm. property owner. Um, we as the board can only really, we can keep saying no. We've come to you a year ago and asked you to buy the property. It hasn't happened yet. Um, so now we have a gentleman who's ready to retire and would like to sell his business that he's had for 30 plus years. Okay, but how does that, I mean... Uh, this I'm just trying to, I'm just in my mind, just real but simple. you're trying it's, uh, to say, okay, so. Yeah, help me understand. Us, if you're going to explain to the public to in a headline. It's going to protect the house. Okay, it's going to protect the house. With even far, further notifications, the state of Michigan right now, their historical <laughs> deeming falls under the DNR rule. If they don't want it to be historical anymore, they just take the sign down. There is nothing saying you have to have, have it. They, there's no blocking. Okay. They will, you could tear that house down. All they have to do is rip the sign out. So the rationale is, okay, we can give up some of the property here, but the house gets extra protection and more. And so does the trail. The trail will be highlighted and landscaped nicely okay. where what little of the trail is left. Now, to me, is the dirt that's on that trail now the, really the trail that was walked? Probably not. There are some parts that you can't see anymore. The actual Almond Star sits on the trail. I'm part of it. So, ma'am, ma'am. Oh, hang on. This is the incoming president. <laughs> oh, you're the incoming, <laughs> the incoming chairman. Yeah. Okay. Um, you could approach. Um, I just want to like to add um, with the trail, we have the marker right now, we have the divot. The tree, I believe, is one of the biggest evidence that the, the trail was actually there and existed. It's a bent tree. I, I, I encourage you all to Google <laughs> what a bent tree is. It's manipulated by humans, but could be older than the house. We do not know. It's Native American in nature, I believe, and it, and it points in a certain direction. Correct. So um, that, to me, is just as important as the house to preserve. Mm -hmm. um, and we all agreed on our commission that that is an extremely important artifact to, save, um, to preserve and protect. Um, I'm a little disturbed that they're not agreeing to protect um, the trees as much as I would like. Um, so I would just encourage you to take that into consideration. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Macy. Um, Ms. Isaacson, you did, did you say you were the no vote? I don't vote. Oh, you don't vote. Um, I'm just curious what the reason was behind the no vote. The no vote was Rick Karlowski, and he's not here. I am here. Oh, yes, you are here. Rick's here. You want him to come up? Mr. Karlowski, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone objects. I mean, he's on the historical commission. Come on up. It's, it's good to hear the various. Per we're here for information. And you sit on the historical commission, so. Uh, <clears throat> yes, the no vote was primarily because he said he would he would do everything he could to save the tree, but was not going to save the particular pine tree that is of historical significance. And I thought that was, uh, that was not, I mean, there was a lot of, well, we'll tries. There wasn't of, we wills. So we did dig, we did get the, um, the trail uh, landscaping, which I thought was 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 reasonable, but there was uh, way too much uh, we will tries on the trees and not enough we shalls or we wills, and okay. that's why I did not. And plus, there was uh, a basically a stipulation at the time that we had to approve the site plan um, going forward, but then he reserved the right to modify it. Well, 
what the heck? If, if that's what you're going to have, then, I mean, he was not willing to give us a, a, another crack at it after he made adjustments. So, but the, primarily, primarily it was uh, the, the tree that was of historical significance it was, was not a, a shell, it was a old try. Okay. Thank you. Fair enough. And since then, he's committed to trying big time. Any other questions from Ms. Isaacson or Mr. Gillen? Mr. Uh, whoa, that was a tie. I'm going to go with Commissioner Lavasser. <laughs> uh, do you recall how many units? Uh, 32 yeah. rooms. 32 rooms? And how many stories? One story. We're going to have a basement and a one story build on above ground. Okay. Is it, one, is, it is it two? I think it was okay, two. Okay, two above ground, excuse me. Yeah, I was I believe it was two stories. I'm a little foggy. It's late. <laughs> Commissioner Douglas. Yeah, I just I really want to thank the Historical Commission for their thoughtful approach to this decision. I know when the for sale sign first went up on this property, people were very concerned about what might happen there. But it sounds like, you know, we have a thoughtful developer who came forward with a reasonable plan. It, the Historical Commission didn't all agree, but it seems like there was a productive discussion um, and it, that you've come to a reasonable decision. And I just want to thank you and thank you for your years of service on the commission. I mean, I'll just add that, you know, I, again, echo, I appreciate the time our historical commission puts into preserving our history. Um, I think for me on this particular matter, um, you know, I'm obviously this will go to the planning commission. It will come back up here. Um, just, just my feedback is uh, I have grave concerns about the tree as well. I understand the importance of it, and I think Mr. Karlowski brings up some really good points. There's a difference between I try and I will, mm -hmm. and, you know, if the petitioner is listening, uh, I prefer to hear I will um, and understand what we can do to, to make. That doesn't mean I agree with the whole plan, but if I had to put an area of focus, uh, I get the benefits of preserving the star house, and that's something that um, we have to weigh as a community. The benefits of you know preserving and locking in the significance and the protections of that house versus um, you know losing some of that green space, but the trail and tree are critical, and uh, that's what's going to be going on in my brain. And just as a side note, I had approached the uh, Mount Pleasant Potawatomi tribe; they weren't interested at the time. And ironically, their name, the chief's name, is Don Johnson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other one I approached was Sugar Island tribe. Of Chippewas, and they were willing to really come down and fight if we need it. So that's okay. great. I do have one more thing, though, if I may. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Long and lengthy, just the way you like it. When I came onto the ROHC, I faced many obstacles. We had shaken down board that did nothing but meet, nothing. No work came out of their meetings. I was greeted by a house that was a museum that was severely neglected. And since then, I and we have faced many challenges to give the residents of this city a historical home they can be proud of. For instance, the gardens at the Orson Star, when I first came on, you couldn't see the beautiful perennial hostas that are four feet tall due to the weeds. The basement was filled with tons of stuff that did not pertain to the house, such as a Don Darrell safe. Many of you saw that and remember that? It's back to the Don Darrell family. Modern teapots, tons of modern blankets and clothes, and how many 70s lighting globes did that house need in its basement? <laughs> the roof leaked, the basement leaked, the paint was peeling, and no one talked to the city manager about the state of the house. I was threatened by a certain existing CC member. That was my personal life, had to toe the line to his political thinking. However, I'll let you know, I did not let none of this deter me. The residents deserved a beautiful home full of history and with many of my faces of the ROHC. They are going to be getting one from us. I am thankful for the many people I have met, my current board included, the past board members, the Star House Guild volunteers, Victor Rosa, the young Eagle Scout who took on the project of the historical front fence, Miro Visace, my dear friend Pete Mancour, Don Calder, my left hand, Rick Karlowski, my right, Mike Frentz, Michael Daly, Ruth Cleveland, both the HDSC boards and the HD, Greg Grassel, Carol Schwanger, 
Judy G Davids, David Gillum, and yes, even you, Don Johnson, the bad name you get around this city. <laughs> I thank you all for the many hours you have given me. I volunteered because it's passion, not just an interest. We did the, finish the historical coloring book that was on the books for eight years, the first year I was in. For all the children to learn their city history, which is now in our school district again, as of this year. We do have a Civil War Day and we have paranormal tours and we also have the historical tours. In 2020, the Orson Star House turns 175 years old. It's, been in, it's in a great shape now. The inventory was recently finished. The house itself is painted inside and out. The roof has been fixed and a newly retrofitted back 1915 kitchen has been done. Yes, there is and always will be work left to do. I won the Sophie Bowman Award, but I only accepted it as the ROHC board, not me. My board is an awesome bunch of volunteers. We work our fannies off. They rock, and they have my deepest thanks. So tonight, I stand before you to tell you all of this. I must resign my position. I unfortunately no longer fill the resident requirement as of October 24th meeting. The newly elected ROHC chairman is Alexander Kerrigan. And she will do a great job. I hope nothing for the best of her and for the ROHC and for the city. And one more thing. Yes, I'm tearing up and I'm trying not to. To all the residents out there, if you do anything, anything that's great for the city, volunteer, give your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Isaacson. All right, after that, I don't think we're going to ask her any more questions. <laughs> you can ask me all the questions. <laughs> all right, I think uh, we appreciate your service, Ms. Isaacson. We know you work hard out there. It's not just time, it's blood, sweat, and tears. And you know, everything you listed, we all see with our eyes. So you made a meaningful difference, and we're grateful. Thank Go you. Go out to the house and see it. You will be pleasantly surprised. All right. Let's um, move on to agenda item number 12. Did we lose? Oh, I guess we lost Commissioner Douglas. You're about to lose me, too, actually. You guys want to take a five-minute recess? Okay, we'll take a five-minute recess. We'll reconvene. Grab your popcorn. Take a washroom break. All right, we'll reconvene. We don't need Mr. Johnson uh, here to begin the next topic. We found out there's several Mr. Don Johnsons out there, so we can just pick one of the many. But now that we lost Pat Perouche. Oh, good. Thank you, Commissioner Perouche. All right, so this brings us to item number 12, the Michigan Liquor Control Commission license establishments. Um, we have two items tonight. One is Bolero Lanes, 4209 Coolidge Highway, request to amend the plan of operation. The other is Sake Sushi, 410 South Main Street, request to transfer. So let's start with item letter A, under 12. Uh, Mayor, City Commission, we received a request from Bolero Lanes on LLC to review a new proposed plan of operation for... Uh, the establishment located at 4209 Coolidge Highway. The applicants have purchased a Class C liquor license with Sunday sales, dance permit, and the bowling permit. Uh, the applicants will continue to do business as Bolero. Bolero is fun. LLC is owned by David Zanea, Dean Elliott, and Kelly Elliott. The applicants purchased the business, uh, including the Class C license and inventory for $50,000. Coolidge Land Holdings LLC, which is similarly owned, Purchase a real estate for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and is leasing it to Bolero is Fun LLC. David Ziena is currently the vice president of Majestic Theater Center Incorporated, which operates a bowling alley restaurant and concert venue in Detroit. He's been actively <coughs> involved in the entertainment business for many years and has held a stake in a ML 
CC licensed establishment since 1992. Dean Elliott is an attorney and previously owned a majority interest in a business, uh, a licensed business in Hamtramck, the Falcon Club, uh, which operated from 1993 to 1995. Kelly Elliott, the wife of Dean, is a school psychologist and has never held an MLCC license. Uh, the Majestic Theater Center has had uh, a few violations they are listed in the report. If approved, Bolero will continue to operate as a bowling center with 16 lanes, a lounge area, and a kitchen. The applicants will, will spend approximately $225,000 on extensive renovations, including new bowling lanes, cosmetic updates, and a 1970s themed rumpus room atmosphere. Requested hours of operation are Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. to 2 a.m., Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m., and Sunday from 12 p.m. to 2 a.m. Kitchen will feature Mexican-themed food along with traditional snack, snack bar items. Um, uh, the anticipated uh, ratio of food to sales uh, will be 10% food, 40% alcohol, 50% bowling. Uh, the square footage has not changed. Uh, pr total proposed seating is 154 patrons. Um, beverages, including alcohol beverages, will be served by Bolero staff immediately after the order is placed at the counter. Table service will not occur. Bolero will feature occasional live music in the lounge area as well as a DJ for rock and bowl Bolero. Uh, uh, for rock and bowl, Bolero is requesting to have one dance floor in the lounge area. The dance floor will be approximately 10 by 10 and be used when dining is not in use. The applicants have agreed to sign and strictly adhere to the city's entertainment and dance permit agreements. Um, uh, the applicants have a history of being responsible bar, uh, business owners and operators. Uh, our findings indicate that they meet the necessary requirements to be granted this request, and we don't have any uh, any objection to this request. <coughs> what is your experience with rumpus rooms? <laughs> <laughs> Perspective, please. Uh -huh. I have none. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't resist. Any questions for the chief? Not uh, uh, other than the question that was, you know, permeating with most of us that I was forced to ask. Okay. Petitioners. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Chief. Um, Jim Razor, 201 East 4th, uh, on behalf of the petitioner, um, Bolero's Fund, LLC. Let me uh, introduce Dean Elliott. Uh, Dean's a lawyer that uh, I have been uh, very acquainted with for approximately 17 and a half years. He's a good operator, uh, stand-up guy. I think he'll do a wonderful job with this. I, I'm very impressed that uh, this level in, of investment is going into this facility, which uh, Dean has found is a lot like... Um, this facility is a lot like uh, that movie with Tom Hanks, where the house, like, uh -huh. you know, ate up all the money. What's that called? Money Pit. Money, money, yeah, Money Pit. pit. Um, turns out that all the bowling apparatus was done, it had to be junked. Uh, the lanes were done, they had to be junked. The whole place needs to be redone. Fortunately, uh, Dean and his wife, Kelly, and, and I'm very sorry to uh, apologize for Kelly and for David tonight. They both had child care responsibilities, and it was difficult to figure out what the agenda that you had, exactly what time they'd be here, and, and they didn't have an option besides bringing the kids, and I didn't think that that would be something that would be helpful with all the public comment that you had. But what I can tell you about Dean and Kelly, their home is just a, a gorgeous 60s, 70s venue. I don't know. You've seen it in some local magazines. It was in what Detroit Home? Cover of Detroit Home. Uh, on the cover. And 70s rumpus room means essentially Dean's home, which is uh, all the stuff that you grew up with in the 70s. It's shag carpeting and mirrors and lots of orange and, and a very cool reuse of this building, which uh, was built in the 50s, actually predated, I think, our ability to even have liquor licenses, became licensed in the 70s, has been in operation since. I think, uh, with the exception of the executive lanes at uh, uh, Paul Glantz's place, this will be the only bowling venue in the city. It'll be redone, it'll be modern, it'll be functional, still going to have open bowling, bowling for kids, things like that. It's a very minor modification of the plan of operation, as the chief has described. Happy to answer any questions for you. Uh, I think it'll be a real asset for us. Questions? Commissioner Lavasser. 
Whenever I see a breakdown of food to alcohol, it's like, okay, uh, I, I try to put this in context. I mean, can you tell, tell us a little bit what, what you expect as far as the, the, the business that you'll do and who's going to consume alcohol on the premises? Well, um, <coughs> left, sir. The, uh, what, I, what I see is that in the evening with bowling leagues, there's beer drinking and alcohol drinking with the adults. Uh, we're going to be also uh, advertising the family. So there's going to be alcohol that's served. It's not the primary purpose of the business. Uh, Mr. Zania has operated the bowling alley. His family has been operating the bowling alley since 1946 in Detroit. And it's also the longest running bowling alley in the, in the history of the United States. It's been open since 1911. And uh, based on his operations there, that's where we based our numbers off of. His numbers are slightly skewed because he has concert, concert venues, he has more late night sales for uh, food, but based on the sales in the daytime, that's how we made our projections. So based on evidence and based on, uh, he's been involved in the bowling business since he was five years old. So his father put him to work right away. So uh, it's not just a plain projection and pulled out of anywhere. It's based on the actual sales uh, and the business model that we're following from downtown. Even though that being said, I don't know if you uh, all know where the Majestic is right across from Union Street. Uh, it's been a stalwart of Detroit for many, many years. And what they're seeing is a lot of alcohol sales, like Dean said, coming from concert venues and coming from people. I mean, certainly where Bolero is located, it's more of a, a family and suburban operation than it would be. These statistics could be horribly off. I don't think they are. I, they're probably right. Previous sales as well. That's what they did at the bowling alley. That was their numbers as well. So they, they, and it's sort of an industry standard. So if you if you were to look at an IRS audit guideline, those are the numbers that they come up and look at. So those are the numbers that typically hit. So I'll bet you on the other hand though, I mean Bolero was never known for its food. Um, and the uh, operation with the kitchen here, and there, there's a substantial investment in the kitchen. Two hundred thousand, two hundred and fifty. Well, what do you, what do you think? The kitchen next year we're gonna be building a pizzeria. We have a, a space approximately the size of this that's unused in the bowling alley of this room that we're going to be building a pizzeria in, which we'll be seeing you again at that point. So uh, right now there is an existing grill. There's a griddle fryer mm. um, and some things that we're going to just operate on from year one because we've encountered, the building has not had any maintenance in 30 years. So we've encountered a lot of issues with the building and it had to, to uh, make contracts with a, a lot of contractors that we weren't expecting to have contracts with. I.e. the money pit. <laughs> but in any event, it's a good resource for the community. I think we'll do consistent food with what we've done and expand that use in the future. I'd just like to note that we're not going to be open in November. We're probably going to be open in February. So that, that, that's, this was uh, written in August when I had more of stars in my eyes. So. <laughs> Other questions? Commissioner Proosh. I'll move approval of this um, application. Okay. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Proosh, second by Commissioner Newbuck. Discussion? Commissioner Proosh. Oh. We're in a public hearing. Oh, we are? Oh, oh, oh. That's right, we have to have a public hearing. Um, these are not public hearings. This is just to amend a plan of operation. Oh, so. Okay, then. Oh. then oh, okay. All right. You guys are right before you're wrong, and now you're right. Okay. Right again. Commissioner Pruch. Uh, uh Well, I was hooked in, as soon as I saw that the people who were operating the Majestic Theater are involved with this, this venue. Um, being a Wayne State Law School grad and having drifted up that way with students periodically after class, um, and then also much later going to special events there. I know that it's, it's been an operation for a very long time. It's a fantastic operation. Um, they do a, a fantastic job. They're an asset to the city of Detroit. And the fact that they're bringing those skills and those resources and that money and all of that and being willing to invest in the city, I think is it's wonderful. I don't think we could ask for anything better. So I think this is terrific. Thank you. Commissioner Dubuck. I agree. It's wonderful to see this you know, kind of investment breathing new life into uh, an older facility. And it's going to be a, you know, family friendly uh, and stylish, I think, uh, place. So, I mean, it's, it's exactly everything we want. So I'm um, excited to see it and I hope you have tremendous success. Mr. Douglas? I just want to say that for a business that incorporates a restaurant, a bar, a bowling alley, and a concert venue to have only had six liquor license violations in more than 20 years is astonishing. Congratulations. Mr. Gibbs? 
I just want to say I love Bolero. It's not too far from my house. I don't walk there in my bowling shoes, but I do have new bowling shoes, so I look forward to putting them to use. <laughs> they're plaid, they're super cute, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> what, co what color? They're, they're, they're like Burberry. Oh my God. Oh. Of course. We look forward to seeing them. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll just add, this is a group, I mean, when I saw this come through, heard about what was going on, very excited about it, exactly what we need, the type of investment that is going to continue to push Royal Oak uh, further ahead as one of the most desirable places to live. This isn't, this is outside our downtown, it's an exciting spot, and I think your approach, I think there's always that temptation to try to modernize everything and, you know, use all these modern cues, and the fact that you're you know, keeping sort of this Americana pastime, you know, exactly in the era it needs to be in um, is, is, is amazing and a tribute to your artistic vision. So thank you, Mr. Elliott. Thank you. Just so you know, we outlived You did what? We were going to tear it down. It was going to be teared down. So then there was another offer that was on the table, and we outbid them. They were going to tear it down. So. Even better. Thank you twice. Good save. Yeah. Good save. That's a... Uh, I would say strike, but <laughs> Ooh. and that'd be that's true. My embarrassed mayor. <laughs> Let's keep your remarks out of the gutter, Commissioner Lavasser. <laughs> uh, setting them up and knocking them down. Oh, oh no. man, you're a baller, Commissioner Douglas. <laughs> All right, I give up. I give up. <laughs> All right. Well, we got a motion on the table. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. All right. We look forward to uh, a February opening. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Razor. Okay. This brings us to item B. Uh, Mayor, City Commission, we have a request to review a new plan, of, a new proposed plan of operation from Saki Sushi to be located at 410 South Main Street. The license and business were purchased from Old Detroit City Grill LLC. The applicants are requesting to reclassify the existing tavern license to a Class C liquor license. This request requires local government approval. Um, the applicants will be doing business as Saki Sushi. Uh, the applicants are not proposing any major changes to the existing plan of op operation, merely changing the name, menu, and some cosmetic updates. The existing floor plan will remain unchanged except for replacing the service counter with a six-seat bar. <coughs> Saki Sushi is equally owned by Mr. Kim and Mr. Kang. The applicants purchased the liquor license for $25,000. The existing fixtures and equipment for $75,000. Uh, will spend and they will spend approximately twenty thousand dollars on cosmetic renovations to the interior of the business. Um, Mr. Kim has been actively involved in the restaurant business for ten years. He currently owns and operates two restaurants licensed by the MLCC, Soho in Rochester Hills and Wasabi Korean and Japanese Cuisine in Detroit, on the campus of Wayne State University. A MLCC check of these businesses revealed no violations since their opening in two thousand and nine. Mr. Kang has worked in the restaurant business for many years. He's a general manager of both Soho and Wasabi Korean and Japanese cuisine. Mr. Kang will oversee the daily operations for Saki Sushi. Um, we have contacted uh, Captain Johnson, Oak County Sheriff's Department. Captain Johnson states that they have not, had any negative, have not had any negative contact with Soho Restaurant since its opening. We've also spoke with Lieutenant Barron of Wayne State University Police, who uh, uh, gave a similar recommendation for wasabi, Korean, and Japanese cuisine. If approved, uh, Saki Sushi will operate a full-service Japanese and Korean restaurant with sushi bar. With sushi bar. Uh, Saki su okay. The menu will offer lunch, dinner, appetizers, entrees, noodle dishes, rice specialties, and sushi. They also feature box lunches for customers on the go. Proposed hours of operation are 10 a.m. until midnight, seven days a week. Um, the seating will be similar, approximately 61 patrons, including six seats at the bar. Um, the applicants are not requesting either an entertainment or dance permit. This was originally a redevelopment license that was approved under the bistro concept. Saki Sushi will continue to comply with the provisions of the bistro concept. Our findings indicate that the applicants meet the requirements. Uh, we do not expect this 
uh, business to cause any additional strain on police resources. Uh, it's worth noting that the applicants will have to comply with all planning, zoning, building requirements and restrictions. Questions for the chief? Mr. Levasseur. You know, I think I may have known this once upon a time, but I can't recall it. Uh, what, what, what's the primary difference between the tavern license and the Class C license? Tavern is just beer and wine. Um, it's just a classification at the state. So this will allow them to sell liquor also. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the chief? Okay. Well, Good welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> members of the City Commission Chief. Thanks for that. I think they're going to have to add bowling. I, I just <laughs> may not get approved. This is Mr. Kang. This is Mr. Kim. Um, hopefully you've gotten a chance to take a look at their menu. You know, we've had sort of two burger places in that space um, come and go. And we think this is a really nice fit for the city. It's something that's probably needed downtown. I, I especially like the idea that they're going to be doing these box lunches. Um, we did need to come to the city commission to get the license reclassified from the tavern to the full class C. Um, Saki is a main, uh, a main stay in their, in their business. And um, that is actually considered... Um, a wine, so we could do it under a tavern license, but they want the ability to have a full service um, bar in, in conjunction with their food. Um, they have a lot of experience. Um, the, their location in Rochester Hills is very close to my home. It's very good. It's family friendly. The, the food is fantastic. Great service. Um, I think there will be a nice addition to the downtown, and we're asking that you approve the plan tonight. Questions? Oceans? Well, Commissioner Dubuck. I'll move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck, second by Commissioner Pruch. All right, discussion. Commissioner Pruch. I just want to be clear that the motion not only approves the plan of operation, but also approves the request to reclassify the license from tavern, or to tavern. From tavern yes. to class From tavern C. to class C. Yes. Okay. Other discussion? Commissioner Dubuck. Say with a you know, positive recommendation uh, from the chief, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, established business uh, with a, a, a solid record, and, and I think there's a large demand for sushi. And again, with the dramatic increase we're going to be seeing in daytime foot traffic, I think you're going to do very well. So, good luck. All right. Well, I'll just say, gentlemen, welcome, and thank you to Royal Oak, or thank you to you for coming to Royal Oak, and uh, I have a sense that this vote may go relatively positively, so I'm preemptively saying, you know, thank you. But uh, we look forward to your concept, and I think it'll be a good fit there as well. And, uh, you know, as you get it implemented, like Commissioner Dubuck said, we have a lot of vibrant things going on right now in our community, and, uh, you know, your investment is, uh, you know, much appreciated here. So thank you. All right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Official now. <laughs> Good luck, gentlemen. All right, we're on item number 13, the snow removal communication strategy. Ms. Davids, Judy D. Um, so... Good evening, uh, commissioners and mayor. Um, the commission asked uh, staff to put together a communication strategy to encourage residential and community property owners to keep sidewalks clear um, following snowfall. And we, I looked at um, several cities that are doing a good job of that right now. Um, those cities include Chicago, Boston, and Washington, D.C. They all have really good... Uh, uh, campaigns going. Uh, they also, um, also all those cities do have snow ordinances, or they have an ordinance um, as well. But um, just as a first step to uh, encourage um, people to be good neighbors and help each other, uh, one of the, my favorite strategies was from a was from Greenfield, Wisconsin, where they have a shovel it forward campaign, which encourages you know neighbors to help neighbors. And so, um, actually, that movement started out of the fire department there. So, um, uh, Dan Phillips of the fire department 
worked with me. He reached out to that city, asked him if they had any problems with us kind of stealing their brand, and they said no. They were actually pretty flattered. Um, so um, with that, uh, our fire department decided that they would really get behind this movement as well, and uh, we immediately got um, a community choice credit union to get involved, and they've provided, and Friends Hardware have provided some snow shovels, so if you're reason you can't clear your walk is because you don't have a shovel. We've got you covered there. Um, but anyways, we just put together some very simple concepts um, for what it means to shovel it forward. Um, Chicago, I think, had the easiest uh, rule for removing snow, which is just basically a 7-10 rule. If it snows between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., they expect you to clear your walks by 10 p.m. that night. And if the reverse is true, if it snows overnight between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., you have till 10 a.m. to clear your walk. So, I mean, obviously we don't have an ordinance, but we would just ask people to try to pledge to, um, if it snows during the day, to clear your walks by 10 p.m. that night, and if it snows overnight, to clear your um, walks in the morning before you go to work. And then it also just includes um, helping elderly and those with um, disabilities remove snow. Um, there is... Um, and to clear your entire sidewalk, not just do one shovel width, but clear the entire uh, sidewalk so that a uh, wheelchair or stroller can pass. Um, we ask if your property is adjacent to um, bus shelters to pledge to keep those clear of snow and ice. And um, also not to push, um, this is a DPS request, not to push your snow into the street <laughs> or into somebody else's driveway. Just keep it <laughs> uh, somewhere on your property. Um, we have several ways to get out this message, um, which includes um, creating a website. Um, we have resources for help. Uh, we do have some, um, some programs available to residents, elderly residents with low, um, that meet certain like income standards to get help. Um, we would have on that page, page a report of concern. So if you cannot, for some reason, help your neighbor, remove their snow, you can report it to us and we will get involved by sending that person a, a letter. Um, information on how to borrow a shovel. Um, and then just doing a better job of communicating in our e-blast and snow emergency alerts the, um, the request to shovel your walk. Um, WRK, WRK showed me some really cool concepts um, for videos that they have in the works. Um, we can also do water bill stuffers, um, social media campaign, insight magazine articles, and we've created, it's just a concept, you guys, if you don't, guys don't like it, it doesn't hurt my feelings, but we created a little, um, it's basically a snow gauge, so it has like a little, um, measurement there, um, we were um, thinking about passing like something this around to neighborhoods surrounding schools to just remind people to shovel it forward. So it's just something cute. Um, we all know that signs, like certain signs pop up all over the city. I know I have a sign of a bunny in my yard and people always ask me what that bunny means and why I have it. So um, hopefully this would create some um, uh, momentum too. So that is basically uh, what I have. Does anybody have any questions for me? Questions for Ms. Davids? Commissioner Douglas. Yes, this is all, this is great. Thank you. Um, but how are we going to reach uh, businesses uh, to tell them about it? Because they yeah. don't live in Royal Oak. They may have a landlord who doesn't. Yes. Work. So we would, re we would um, hope that residents would... Um, let us know that and report them, and then we'll send them a, a letter just the same, you, you know, with why why it's important that they shovel their walks. But, I mean, it's, it's a specifically like a city-to-business campaign. Um, uh, it, it's interesting. I talked to who I thought was an expert on snow removal, my letter carrier. <laughs> he told me that um, he didn't really see it as uh, much of a problem with businesses as... Um, with homeowners not shoveling. That's just his experience walking around doing his route. But we know that there are businesses that don't shovel their walks, um, and we would just reach out to them with a letter asking them to. So, I mean, particularly, I mean, I like the, the 710 rule. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like something that we would want to share with businesses in advance as opposed to waiting until they fail and then sending them a letter. 
Um, yeah, I, I think I mean, that I think that that is fine. So, are you thinking that I, we would? Uh, so, you don't think they would catch on our on our just regular other blitz of stuff that we're doing? Because we are not just asking this of homeowners, but asking this of businesses too. Right, but the the tools, the communication tools that that are are easily available to us, Insight magazines, mm -hmm. um, water bill stuffers, W R O K E blasts. I mean, I. Uh, Per, do you know how many business owners, for example, are on our e-blast list? Um, I would say quite a few because whenever I send out, um, whenever our system sends out a text message, the the number of responses that I get back that somebody didn't get it are almost always from businesses. I guess we don't, you know, in general as a society, we don't set up our personal accounts to... Um, to do that, you know, to send up an autoresponder, but I know that a lot of businesses are signed out because I couldn't, I couldn't figure out why I kept on getting emails from FedEx Kinkos every time I said, and then I realized they're just, it's just an autoresponder letting me know that they got my email because they sign up for our email blast. Hmm. So I do, I do think that there's a significant number of businesses that are signed up for our email blast. Yeah, I, and, and that's great. I, I just still don't feel like this. There's any component in here at all that is specifically designed to to target business owners. I mean, I think about like Delamere between Normandy and Fourteen Mile, which is, you know, a pretty major corridor. And how I mean, you know, downtown businesses we don't have to worry about them because we shoveled the walks already. But I just would like to see an element in this that reaches out more specifically to um, business op business operators. That's a good point. I mean, I, I can I could work with the chamber. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I I guess it's like I don't normally do that. So. Um, I normally talk to residents, so I will think about that and definitely include them in my strategy. Yeah. Please, thank Sorry you. about that. I think it's a learning experience. This isn't a one or done, right? So yeah. as we perfect it, as we learn, uh, as we get better and as we get feedback, I mean, we can figure out the right way, uh, the optimal way, the scientific yeah. way to uh, engage both uh, residents and business owners. So I think it's a great idea. I think we'll get there. Um, yeah. And it's something we're going to hopefully do for some time to come so we don't have to get it perfect. It's better to be roughly right than exactly late. And yeah, well, I'm really hoping that residents take us to heart when we say that they can report, you know, mm -hmm. somebody that's not shoveling. And, and the city will definitely send them a letter and ask them, you know, to or demonstrate the importance of keeping your walks um, clear. I know we don't have an ordinance, but I had Commissioner Macy next. Okay. Um, first of all, I love the yard signs. I think no. those are going to be so great around the school. Then they can see how much snow has fallen, and uh, I think it's super cute. I love roaming. Um, I actually do not love the seven to ten rule. Uh, first of all, I think it's it's a it's a little bit confusing. Like, wait, if it's seven, then what do I have to do at the ten? Uh, but I, and also, I feel like it's really I feel like it's really hard. Um, I mean, I know it, in my house, it's, it's a miracle that my children get to school and my husband and I get to work on time in the morning, and we we almost never are able to shovel in the morning. Uh, and, and I think I just think it's I guess I would prefer just a like 24 hour rule. So if the, when the snow stops, try to get it within 24 hours. It seems like it's both more feasible, more understandable. Um, yeah, so that's it. And the other thing I was going to ask about was, do we have anything about um, moving cars? Because that's another part of this, like the snow emergency, and it seems like that communication could be improved too as part of this. Absolutely. Getting cars off the street, that's always part of our, um, that's pretty standard in our snow emergency um, e-blast is to get your cars off the street. And that has been um, on our webpage about snow emergencies, but we can definitely um, up that. I know that that's a problem. Don knows that that's a problem for me because I don't have a driveway. <laughs> so I'm one of those cars that just panics whenever it snows because I don't have a driveway. I have a 102-year-old house here in Royal Oak. And um, so I am well aware of that cars have to be off the street. So we usually, we're usually pretty good at getting that message out. Commissioner Dubuck. Um, yeah, Mrs. Davids, thank you. I think this is I love everything you've laid out here. I think we can fine tune the messaging if, if it's not 710 within 24 hours, whatever. Um, I love the graphic. I think it's a very 
positive message to start with, to start socializing the importance as a community of clearing our sidewalks, uh, just letting people know it's about accessibility and, and courtesy to your neighbors. Um, uh, for outreach to businesses, uh, you know, I agree. You know, we'll have to strategize a little bit. I think most of the businesses are the water customer in a, in a lot of cases, though, right? So they should get the water bill communications. Mm -hmm. um, but they should it, get Insight Magazine. They should they should receive the Insight, mm -hmm. and then also uh, if we were to we could come up with even a door hanger, um, you know, for these commercial stretches. I don't know if it'd be appropriate to ask like folks reading meters to drop door hangers as they're out, at, but. Uh, you know, that, that's another way to get in front of them. We also have the, the billboard option, right, mm -hmm. where uh, we have uh, deals with certain uh, billboard operators that we can put messaging out on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm, I'm curious about um, uh, inventorying the different uh, groups that would provide assistance if, we're, if we can send communication out to civic groups and churches, just let them know yeah. that we're going to be providing this inventory to residents if this is something they offer, we would love for them to be included. Yes, we, we do on the page um, tell, we, we do tell people to reach out to um, faith communities. We know which ones they are. I, I mean, obviously, some churches, they're not going to be able to shovel every walk in the city. Um, uh, we did we did talk about, like, I wanted to create something called Snow Corps, like, like AmeriCorps, but Snow Corps. Um, but we do have issues with um, needing background checks and stuff like that. We don't want to... Um, right. Puts we, I, they talked about Nancy Daly tonight. We don't want to put somebody in the um, create a victims <laughs> list, more or less. You know, of people that um, need assistance. Yeah, we so, want reputable. Yeah, sources, we need yeah. reputable people if we're sending them to somebody's house to assist an elderly person. That they're not going to take advantage of them. So, um, but yeah, we we have we have I have worked with um, with faith communities that are willing to help. Okay. Well, one thing I think that'll help businesses too is, I mean, you know, as this message gets out there and we start talking about it as a community and it becomes a little bit more in the front of mind when it snows, I think people, you know, once they see the signs up, I mean, it's a little bit of everything. They'll walk into businesses and they'll say, hey, what gives? How come, you know, your sidewalk isn't cleared? You know, so there'll be some of that sort of socialization about, right. you know, hey, yeah, we should be thinking about our elderly neighbors or thinking about yeah. our sidewalks. I mean, I think sometimes people aren't just being, they're not being rude or, or ignorant or, you know, have malice towards our neighbors. I just think the more we talk about it, the more we're aware of it, and the more we try to help each other out. And I think businesses will be in that same conversation. And my personality is such, if I send a letter and the problem continues, I'm happy to go over with my little sign <laughs> and ask them, um, you know, to explain how important this is to our community. I, I know I live near Shar and I walk downtown a lot and I know how frustrating it is to to not be able to walk, you know, past certain places because they don't shovel. So put her sign on the stick and walk back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Like a pick <laughs> stick. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gibbs. Um shaming. I was at the post office and spoke to the post office um, sometime last week. Just so you are aware, a letter now takes seven to ten days to be delivered. It's not two or three days like it used to be, and we all experienced that with the um, proposal, letter about the proposals. So something to keep in mind. Number two, maybe I lean on Mr. Gillum for this. What are the appropriate times to be snow blowing or not appropriate times to be snow blowing? Summertime. From, from, a, from a noise perspective, <laughs> from, from a resident's perspective, because we're focusing this on residents. Yeah, we, we don't have specific provisions in the, uh, in the ordinance time-wise. I mean, we have, do have the decibel limitations. I don't believe a snowblower would exceed the decibel limits. I think it's going to be more a, a question of what's reasonable and what's unreasonable, which has to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. So, yeah. It may not be a good answer for you, but it's but is it, is it 7A? I mean, what's the noise ordinance say? Well, we also have to keep in mind that, I mean, I hope to goodness that it's not a problem because that means we're getting a ton of snow every single day. Probably, you know, the worst we'll have is, you know, it's once a week or something like that. But Right. Yeah, but still, if, I mean, if a snowblower is too loud once a week, you know, that can be a concern. As, as somebody that lives right off of Main Street, um, 
commercial snow removal things are a problem too because when they back up, they do the beep, 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 yeah. you know. Oh, so they can be yeah. really, really loud. But I do think they usually start at about 6. Yeah. 6 a.m. I don't know how late they go at night, though. I'm up. <laughs> go all night. Yeah, I hear them. Sometimes you can hear them going all night. Yeah. Yeah. Because they have to do a lot of places, so. Okay. Any other questions for uh, Ms. Davids? Wonderful job. Thank you. Motion. Thank you. We have a motion on the table. Or no, we don't. We have a motion in front of us. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, it's not on the table, right? It's I'll, not on the table, no. the resolution. We have a motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Raise a high, Commissioner Macy. Is that okay? Commissioner Macy seconds. All right. Any further discussion? All right. With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion passes. All right. Soft touch before we go to the. I'm gonna spare you my snow jokes. Oh, see, I was just saying, what are the snow jokes? <laughs> we won't have snow jokes on this one. Snow removal company. <laughs> Mr. Gillum. Um, just to follow up, I'm just a quick look at some of the performance standards in the ordinance, uh, which talks about decibel levels, and the general rules are um, so it looks like between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. are when we have the lowest decibel limits. So I guess maybe the the general answer would be. Um, not after 10 p.m., not before 6 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Um, this brings us to item number 14, approval of name for new public space in Main Street Alley. Thank you. Let me start by asking, has everybody had a chance to see uh, the alley since it's been repaired? <coughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the benefits of people at home that, that haven't, the alley behind the businesses on the east side of Main Street from 3rd to 11 Mile has already been repaved with decorative stamped concrete. Uh, the Downtown Development Authority has received a grant to engage an engineering firm to prepare a conceptual design for extending this all the way to 6th Street. Uh, to add to the improvements, Mr. B's restaurant uh, on November 2nd installed a large piece of public art on the side of their building and we hope that's just the first of many. Uh, the objective is to create a space that can be used as additional public space when it's not being used for pickup and deliveries similar to the Detroit Alley now known as the Belt. And in the report I gave you a link to it so you can see a picture of what the Belt looks like and a little bit about it. Uh, we've already had one special event uh, in the recently repaved alley, and we have another one scheduled for November 24th for the DDA Small Business Saturday promotion. Uh, you already approved that uh, earlier in this agenda. Uh, we feel that the space needs to be named. Uh, when the first portion was initially paved, uh, Developer Ron Boji actually suggested a name for it based on the name that he had for his building, uh, The Rock. But with the announcement that Henry Ford is leasing the entire building, I don't think his building is ever going to be known as The Rock. Uh, so we spent some time on coming up with another name, and I'm going to have uh, Elizabeth Robin Sabrin of Franco and Judy Davids come up and talk to you about it. Uh, I just want to start off by saying the importance of naming things because as you're all aware, we had a project that we called uh, the Smart Park for about a year and then we officially named it Eagle Plaza and people continued to call it the Smart Park until like <laughs> recently. Now it's like pretty much once the sign went up, everybody started calling it Eagle Plaza. So I think it's really important that we get that name out there right away and, and uh, so that we can brand it properly. Um, Franco uh, came up with um, 
the name, and then um, simultaneously, I think, uh, they came up with calling it the row, and then somebody came up with Royal Oak Way, and it, it seemed like um, there was like some sort of energy that that's the, what the name should be. But I, we brought Elizabeth here to talk about the importance of branding. So, yeah. so um, it was really a collaboration. We provided a, a list of names and suggestions for Judy and for the team to look at. Um, and it sort of was like a group um, opportunity to brand that. But um, as Judy mentioned, a lot of these opportunities, um, you know, kind of come along and then if things aren't branded, then people will give it a name. And we thought this was a great opportunity as we're moving through the rest of the development project to really kind of brand this space and be able to host public events and celebrations there. And we've actually seen some other communities do uh, really nice things with their alleys that um, we think that you guys can also do in Royal Oak and um, continue to make that a public gathering space for years to come. Questions? Commissioner Pruch. I'll just move approval of the resolution. I think it's an appropriate name. It's very simple. It's very straightforward. Um, it'll catch on uh, once people realize that there's actually going to be a public space back there that they're going to be able to use all the time. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's a good thing. A motion by Commissioner Pruch. Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? Commissioner Dubuck. I think it's great. I think my natural inclination would be to like push back and pressure test it and 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 be critical, but I really like it. Like it, it resonates. It lands well. I feel like. Yeah. It seems to be I, the I best think you way. It. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not include the drawings yet because we've we've still got some work to do on it. But Judy's come up with some pretty creative ideas for how to brand it. Uh, Using a takeoff on the on the city logo, but also incorporating the the brickwork pattern hmm. uh, of the alley. Cool. Yeah, I think one of the the things that's very interesting about it it's it's bigger than what you think. Once you kind of clean it up and freshen it up, and we've already seen Mr. B start to put a little art on the back there, and you know when we get illumination and and, and I, we're using it. I mean, we had a PTA fundraiser for the kids. And uh, we actually walked through there as we were visiting different establishments in the downtown on Saturday. So it was good. It was a good path. Any other uh, discussions, comments? Just thank you. Yeah, I think you guys nailed it when you said Royal Oak Way just kind of fits, you know, makes sense. And the fact that Don Johnson didn't come up with it, and we can see the folks that did, you know, give us a little bit more confidence that it will be really successful. <coughs> All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. Can, can we just mention with the, that official naming that we are going to be doing a press release about um, an event that will take place in the row? Uh, which is November 24th, uh, Santa will uh, be visiting. Um, we would like to do a ribbon cutting, so we'll be inviting you all to that. The event is from 11 to 1, and our friends at Toyology are helping us out, as well as Dessert Oasis, and it should be uh, first 100 kids get um, Santa hats, so it should be a lot of fun. So Wonderful. Entertainment. Yeah. It'll be a good time for families. What are the hours? 11 to 1. Perfect. Well, we'll see you at the row. All right. We'll see you there. All right. This brings us to item number 15, a resolution to create Water Supply Advisory Council. I'm going to be taking this one, too. James came to me this afternoon and asked if he could have the early part of the evening off and miss the closed session so that he could be home for his son's birthday dinner. And I said, for that one thing that's on the agenda, I can read it, and you can spend the whole evening with your son. <laughs> so, that's a good boss. Yeah. Uh, Michigan Department of Environmental Quality recently proposed, adopted, and made effective new rules regarding lead and copper in drinking water systems. Most of these have focused on testing and capital improvement requirements. However, a little discussed item uh, has been a rule that requires a drink 
requires drinking water systems that serve populations of 50,000 or more residents create a water system advisory council. And we included an attachment from the state. This is one that kind of slipped through without anybody really noticing. When we've kind of hit, we're almost against a deadline to get this established. Uh, the purpose of these councils is to improve transparency in their communities by developing materials and advising the water system on public awareness and education efforts. Uh, the rule outlines qualifications for membership on the council as well as the duties to be performed by the council. City needs to have members appointed to the council by December 11th of 2018. To streamline this process, uh, the administration is recommending that members of the Royal Oak Environmental Advisory Board be named as the members of the Royal Oak Water System Advisory Council. Basically doing the same thing that we've done with the DDA, also serving as the Parking Committee, uh, the Planning Commission uh, doubles up uh, with the... Uh, Brownfield Authority. With the Brownfield Authority, uh, and the retirement board doubles as the uh, employee health care board. Uh, so we've provided a resolution uh, which we're recommending be approved uh, that would accomplish this. Questions for Mr. Johnson. Commissioner Dubuck. Just curious if the uh, current members of the environmental board have been briefed on this. We haven't done an official briefing, but uh, sort of kind of through the back door most of the members are aware of it from what I've heard that they're actually very much in favor of it I would think knowing them that they would be um, enthusiastic about this I think it's I think it's uh, an appropriate solution um, Commissioner Macy then Commissioner Bruce. Um so there th there's I can't find out, but there was some state. Oh, yes, to be eligible for appointment, an individual shall have a demonstrated interest in or knowledge about lead and drinking water and its effects. Do the current members of the Environmental Advisory Board meet that qualification? Probably more so than anybody else in the city of Royal Oak, <laughs> especially a couple of members. Commissioner Proust. Um, I know that the statute spells out the responsibilities of the people that are on the council. Uh, two questions. First of all, is there any requirement in the statute, and I should have looked at it, but I didn't, as to how often they have to meet as a council? I know that the environment... Only required to meet once a year. Okay. Um, the second thing is I know in our Insight um, publications we publish, I don't know how frequently, um, reports of, of the water quality tests that are done by the City of Detroit for the Royal Oak Water System. Um, it, do they have to in any way comment on that, publicize that kind of thing? Is that something that's completely separate? I don't believe that they they are required to comment on it. They certainly can. They could also certainly help promote that. Okay. And that is published once a year as well. It's once a year. Okay. Yes. I couldn't recall that. Because that's very detailed, specific information about water quality, not only the lead issue, but also a number of other... Every, pretty much everything that's in the water. Yeah, everything that's in the water. Um, so, um, at least that's, those are resources there that they can use in terms of a, a basis of information for, for public information. So, that's good to have. Not all water systems in the state are going to have that, so they're going to be starting from scratch, unfortunately. But we've got a good base of information already right here as a member of the Detroit Water System. Those are my only questions. Any other questions or motions? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of this motion that would appoint the Art um, Environmental Advisory Board as the Water Quality Council. Moved by Commissioner Perush. Second by Commissioner Dubuck. Discussion? Commissioner Macy. Um, I guess I just have concerns, first of all, whether or not that these members are necessarily qualified to do this. And then also, it, it seems like it is an additional burden. They're supposed to develop plans for continuing public awareness about lead and drinking water. Um, that's outside of what they normally have to do, and it seems like it might take more than one meeting a year to do that, and to make nine members who aren't even aware that they're getting this responsibility get, get stuck with it um, seems questionable. I wonder if it might be a better approach to um, invite them to apply for these positions and invite other members to apply as well and see if we can get this done at the next meeting before December 11th. I'd, I'm just not sure this is the best course of action given the requirements. 
Any other discussion? I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay, motion passes 6 1. Okay, um, this brings us to item number 16 recommendation to reconvene the downtown plan task force. Thank you, Mr. Patton, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Commission. Uh, as you know, the uh, downtown plan task force was established by the City Commission in 2013 to formulate development goals for downtown. Their final report was issued in 2014. And I think we'll all agree there's been a lot of development activity in the downtown since then. Uh, it's my recommendation that to now would be a good time to reconvene that task force, um, both to evaluate the progress made toward meeting those initial goals and to, uh, to establish development priorities, if there are any, uh, for the next five years. Um, I'm recommending that the composition of that board would stay the same. Um, there are nine voting members. My letter actually inadvertently, uh, due to um, a, a battle with Microsoft Word, cut and paste, eliminated the Chamber of Commerce or cha Chamber of Commerce representative. Um, the other eight would be three city commissioners, a rep uh, appointed by the DDA, a rep appointed by the Restaurant Association, a rep appointed by the Retailers Association a business community representative not affiliated with restaurant or retail that would be appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the city commission, and then one at-large representative appointed by the mayor and approved by the city commis commission. Questions for Mr. Fenton? Ms. Gibbs. Do I, I have several questions. Um, do we intend on including Mr. Kammer in this as the DDA or downtown manager? I, I would, if this resolution moves forward, make a request to the DDA to name a representative and I'll defer to the DDA to make their own selection just as I would defer to the Chamber of Commerce or the Restaurant Association. Okay, because um, I would have expected him to be listed in here, but that's fine if we're going to do it that way. Um, I do have some concerns about the members that would be appointed. Um, I think that all of the businesses that are affected should have some sort of representation, which should include maybe a vendor from the farmer's market. They're affected by the whole downtown development. Um, one of the members of the restaurants, or one of the owners of the restaurants that do not have liquor licenses because the Royal Oak Restaurant Association is really only bars. So I, I think that like a freshie who I'm told is booming right now, that they would have forward thinking insight about how to thrive, so, you know, in a situation such as we have currently and moving into the future. Um, and I'm particularly amazed and uh, uh, completely approve of everything that Mr. Bees is doing right now. They have really molded to the concept. So I, like my own public, my own opinion, I, I want Johnny to be appointed. <laughs> he's, he's made incredible progress with his restaurant and his bar and the place is just amazing. The speakeasy, I was down there for the first time the other day and got the whole tour and it's incredible. So, um, but I really think that we should have one of the non-alcoholic serving restaurants represented in this as well as somebody from the farmer's market and honestly the um, vendor on the antique vendors on Sunday. Michelle Lavasser. What, what struck me as a little odd about this is we're, we're looking at a term for this task force of just five weeks and I, I um, No, it would go until oh. 2019. Okay, I'm sorry. I misread the uh, I misread the, the resolution. That would be really efficient. <laughs> <laughs> like, government works fast. I don't know about that fast. Sorry, the holidays. Right, Just right. That's me. Commissioner Macy. Um, I, I'm confused about the, the timing of this. It seems like there's so much going on in downtown right now, and we're really not even, I don't think, halfway through. We've still got a lot of development and change happening, and it seems like right now trying to take it into account before it's even finished 
s seems premature. And also, we, we just we just had the downtown task force, and we're seeing the results of that now. But it, it's almost like we're putting the cart before the horse. And I a little bit agree. Like, isn't the DDA supposed to be doing this on an ongoing basis? Um, well, the task force was initially established by the city commission, and so I'm taking that charge both, um, you know, past president and having somebody in the DDA being a part of that process, um, and then um, and mirroring the same composition. The commission obviously can change that, or if they want to make a recommendation for the DDA to move forward with that, I suppose the commission could do that too. This was initially a, a city commission driven initiative, not a DDA driven initiative. So, so I guess, could you summarize for me what, what the goal of this is? Well, the goal is to establish whether we have actually reached our goals. And I, and I think that there may be um, some discussion whether Henry Ford is, a step, is, is meeting our office goals that we have set, whether we want to continue to, um, whether we want to, elevate that square footage office goal, um, whether we want to continue to use the recommendations in that report, such as marketing city-owned property in order to reach those goals, Incentiv in incentivization to reach those goals. And then there was a vaguely listed retail goal that may be addressed as well, where it was a showcase of distinct eclectic retailers. Um, what does that mean? Is there something different in 2019 that we can do to address that? that and, and frankly, a sector that is much different today than it was five, six years ago. How do we address that if we need to address that? And I, and I think um, through conversations I've had with the city manager, um, we initially considered this may be a strategic goal setting issue for the commission and realized it was a lot larger than that considering everything that has been going on in the public as well. It offers the, the obviously the um, the ability for the public to be a part of this as well, since all of these are going to be open meetings. Commissioner Dubuc. Yeah, I would just say that it's, it's not unprecedented for us to you know, form task force to get a, a real you know, specific look and deep dive done on something. You know, we, have, we have a parks and rec committee, but you know, for Norman Oaks and for the downtown park, we've formed task force uh, to get you know, the commission aligned with folks leading those bodies, aligned with other stakeholders and maximize community input on a very specific focus. So um, since it was a downtown task force that helped uh, advise and set up some of the goals, and, and the DDA was supportive uh, of that effort, had tremendous input into that effort, it allowed a group of people to do a real deep dive into this while the DDA is actually running the day-to-day -day business of the DDA, which, yeah, the development of the downtown is in their purview, but this task force was just bringing more stakeholders to the table um, with the specific goal of, of generating um, a shared vision of what those priorities should be. So I think it's, I think it's appropriate to reconvene. Uh, I, I think that the, the makeup was, was is good. Uh, my only concern with the, the recommendations is, you know, you get a, a body that's too big, it can become unwieldy. Although I do think that um, a, a non-liquor license holding restaurant is, I think that's a healthy voice to have at the table. Uh, as far as farms market or, or market vendors in general, I would think the market manager would be the best person to actually represent that point of view because the market um, exists uh, in various forms all throughout the week, not um, just on uh, you know Saturday and Sunday morning, but the market is is a part of the downtown. So if we wanted that voice there to represent uh, the vendors and, and the other various stakeholders around the market, I think the market manager would be appropriate. Um, but again, that can still even be as like uh, providing testimony input or as a part of the body. I don't know that she has the time for that. Um, but I think it's appropriate to, to bring this, this group back together um, just because it's, it's more stakeholders, more input, um, more public meetings, meaning more oversight, and you know, just kind of driving our vision for making sure we're all kind of pulling in the same direction here. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can echo that. Um, I think the makeup is a bit interesting to me. I think that um, you know, I do have questions about you know, the Restaurant Association because it is pretty much a organization that is limited to establishments with liquor licenses only. Um, the Retailers Association, I'm not sure, um, is that really a formal organization or is that more of a, I mean, do they produce minutes and things like that or might we have a harder time digging into what the actual Retailer Association is? Well, they do have a membership, but it's, it's in flux. Um, I know 
at least participation comes and goes has been my, my um, familiarity with it. Because what would be interesting to me is, you know, how do you blend that mix of old and new? I think Commissioner Gibbs brought up freshy, you know, new, different perspectives. And how do we look at, you know, more traditional established establishments? And um, while well, I get the understanding of putting it on, and it was the right thing to do back in 2012 or so when we, we did this, do you think it makes sense at all to maybe, um, you know, have a criteria that we should have a restaurant represented, a retailer represented, and we have Mr. Kammer work to, you know, get suggestions and talk to people? Because if we leave it up, someone might say, okay, I'll join from the chamber or whatever. But if we go out and say who's interested in it and we talk what the goals are and where people can bring value and not just diversity and function, but diversity and personality, diversity and vision, diversity and um, experience might be, you know, uh, we might be able to integrate that uh, into the task force at this time. Commissioner Perush? I think we also, ha also have to recognize that there are an awful lot of businesses that are downtown that are not retail and are not restaurant and food. Mm -hmm. There's an awful mm -hmm. lot, there's a growing number of service businesses because of the decline in retail in everywhere, but especially here in Royal Oak, um, and a growing number of service businesses that are occupying those spaces. Um, and, and I don't think they need, they should be left out. Um, so I, I, I don't think that there's any need to move on this immediately. I, I think reactivating it, uh, given the fact that we have created so much additional office space, which was one of the primary goals of the original task force, and now we're at a point where we need to revisit what the downtown should be and what do we need to do to assist that along. But I, I think we need to take a harder look at who might be on that task force, given the nature of the businesses that exist there and how it is changing. Because um, I don't think, for example, my guess is that there probably are more service-oriented businesses than there are retailers these mm -hmm. days. Um, so I, I guess I would like to think a little bit more about who should be on this task force before we actually uh, approve it, um, just to make sure that we're actually getting all of the types of businesses that are there uh, effectively represented somehow. Do you, do you think it makes sense for uh, Mr. Fenton and Mr. Kammer to maybe go back and kind of create a little scratch list based on our feedback mm -hmm. tonight to see if they can yeah. come back with something? Mr. Fenton, is that something you would feel comfortable doing? Absolutely. Okay. And, and one other thing before, there's also more residents, people living downtown yeah. than when, the, yeah. down, when this task force. Should there be a residential component, somebody representing you know, mm -hmm. people who live downtown? Um, so I think we just need to take a much harder look at, at who should be on the task force given the way it has changed over time. What I hear Commissioner Proof saying is we have so many different vested yeah. interests and yeah. diversity in our downtown that that's a good thing, but for forming a committee, it's going to be a challenging thing. Yeah. yeah. Commissioner Levasseur. Uh, I, I keep counting and... I, I keep coming up with eight on this list as opposed to nine, and I'm not sure if some, someone got left off or if yeah, I, I, I said initially chamber. that the Chamber of Commerce was inadvertently left off. All right, so that, that, that explains it. Uh, the other thing, I think uh, Commissioner Gibbs makes a good point. Uh, you, know, you know, people associated with the, farm, uh, with the farmer's market I think would be good additions. I think it's overkill to have three city commissioners on here. I'd mm -hmm. much rather have more input from members of the community than, than have three city commissioners on this committee. All right. So we don't have to take any action right now based on that conversation. But is that something you feel that you can bring back, a little recon? Absolutely. Next uh, meeting? We'll see if it's next meeting. Um, but uh, <laughs> certainly understanding it's a priority. So okay. as soon as I can. Thank you, Mr. Fett. Thank you. That brings us to the last and final item of tonight's agenda, which is the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act Options and Recommendation. <clears throat> uh, Mayor, members of the commission, you should have a commission letter uh, that outlines a little bit of background on uh, the most recently passed uh, Marijuana Act as well as a little bit of the, the prior medical marijuana uh, provisions. 
what staff is really looking for this evening is, uh, uh, or recommending this evening, is that you consider uh, continuing the position you had under the medical marijuana, primarily uh, from a planning and zoning standpoint. Uh, we will and have started already getting calls about how to establish uh, the business uh, under this act in the city of Royal Oak. Uh, they can't do that until the state passes its licensing requirements, which may be a year away. Uh, so simply what staff was looking for this evening was uh, a resolution passed that clearly identified that until that time occurs, uh, the city is going to continue in its current stance that these establishments are not allowed and cannot occur in town. So there's a clear indication to all and every party that may want to pursue this. Um, we do, through the planning division and other uh, departments in the city, get calls, uh, and there has to be a, a reply. And you know, they take some time to reply why they can't uh, be uh, considered at this point. Uh, what I would say is, once the state comes up with its licensing guidelines, if the city commission would would want to consider uh, revisions to the zoning ordinance to. Uh, opt uh, uh, into allowing establishments, you may want to look at both the medical marijuana statutes as well as the most recently passed one and craft whatever language you considered at that time. But right now I think it's premature, but I, what I'm really looking for is a, a, a clear statement from the city that no, you can't do these and it'll help staff with replying to uh, uh, people that are currently interested and quite frankly don't understand the statute. Questions for Mr. Twing? Commissioner Dubuck. Um, Mr. Twing, what I'm reading here is that you're looking for direction uh, for the commission to tell staff to draft a resolution prohibiting the Craft things. an ordinance. The, the statute actually calls it an ordinance, not a resolution. Um, by my terms, you can't just simply pass a, a resolution on the fact that it references passing an ordinance. So. What we would look for is uh, working with the city attorney's office, draft an actual ordinance that says they're uh, prohibited. Um, it wouldn't necessarily be a provision in the zoning ordinance. It may be just a standalone ordinance under some other existing ordinance. Um, but what it would do is, and under this recently passed statute, you have to opt out the prior medical marijuana you had to opt in. So by taking no action under the old under the medical marijuana statute, you you didn't have to worry about them. Understood, under, but you under, said there is no threat. No one can get licensed uh, or try and bring a license and set up shop until the state establishes licensing. Is well, we correct? wouldn't, yeah. I mean, but there are provisions in the statute that, that indicate that the communities could take some actions as well, too, uh, in terms of licensing. Uh, understood. I, I, I'm... I'm not sure. Six days ago, 70% of Royal Oakers voted yes on Proposal 1. This seems, one, completely out of balance with our, our residents who turned out in record numbers last Tuesday and overwhelmingly voted for this, more than two to, two to one. Um, so for us, the first order of business to be an ordinance saying, no, we're not going to do that, uh, kind of flies in the face, I think, of our residents as opposed to exploring and beginning a conversation about, okay, what did our residents mean as, as was brought up at public comment? What do our residents want? What would that look like? What are the options we have? Um, I mean, if we're going to say, yeah, there's a moratorium, even though there's a need to be one because there is no licensing right now, I mean, wouldn't we be better off setting goals for ourselves or directing staff to start analyzing what different recommendations would be to reflect the will of 70% of our voters. Uh, th this to me seems like coming today and saying, hey, let's move ahead with the local transit system. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, my, from, from, from my standpoint, I would agree with you in the sense that, that an appropriate time to engage them would be at the time you know what the state regulations are so that you can write your provisions pursuant to what the state's going to allow and license as well. I think it's a little bit of a waste of staff time to come up with our own provisions at this point in time not knowing what those would be uh, and I think the better time to engage the community would be when you do your master plan 
and see what kinds and where, what types of operations and where they would want those to occur as part of that process rather than right now. I agree, and that's the discussion we do need to have. I'm, I'm still but, not clear on the value of this since no one can hang a shingle until state regs exist. <clears throat> Commissioner Dubuck, just a comment. Um, <clears throat> Prop 1 provides that the state has a period of a year to put this licensing mechanism and the framework in place, if you will. Um, but probably based upon the experience that the state had with the, um, the medical marijuana proposal previously, there's a default provision in the Act that if the state doesn't establish the regulatory framework in a period of a year, then um, an individual or an entity has a right to make an application to the local community for the license that it would need to be able to con to operate a, a a recreational marijuana establishment. So we can't necessarily just wait for the state. We have to be somewhat proactive. I, I mean, I. <clears throat> um, we can always amend an ordinance opting out down the road if we choose to do that. Um, but at some point, we're going to have to do something. And if we don't do something, by default, we're going to be opted in. And we're going to have to have all the framework in place to pick up a job if the state doesn't get around to doing it itself. So I guess my question is, as opposed to passing an ordinance that seems to be fly in the face of, of of our residents, can we not pass a resolution or a policy stating we will not issue licenses until such time as the state has defined the process and we have had six months to determine what our local ordinance will be? I can, can we give that kind of policy direction as opposed to establishing an ordinance that is the opposite of what our residents directed us to do? Well, you can adopt any kind of resolu resolution that you want establishing a policy, and I suppose that would provide some direction for the staff, yes. Um, but again, ultimately, we're going to have to, we're going to have to fish or cut bait one or the other. Right. So. Well, and I think that's a conversation we have to have with our, with our residents about what exactly do 70% yes votes mean. You know, um, does it mean we allow for one license in the city in a certain zoning area? Does it mean no? Does it mean people just wanted to be able to possess legally? You know, but I think we need to flush that out. I just feel like we're, this is, I, I'm not comfortable taking this vote until I actually know what, you know, what it is we want to do. I understand we want to take precautions against what the state law is going to allow, but given that none of that's really, we're not staring down the barrel of any of that right now. Right now, right? I don't know. This is brought forward with some urgency, and it's six days after this election feels like it feels a little tone deaf to what our residents said. 55% of residents of Michigan voted yes, 70% Royal Oak voted, voted yes. That's, that's compelling. I understand that, but it, it, at the same time, um, the proposal itself specifically provides a local community with, with the ability to opt out if it wants to. So you're right. I mean, what were people voting yes for? Were they voting yes for personal use? Were they voting yes for some kind of a regulatory framework locally? Well, we know were they, they were voting, voting yes for a statewide. You know, we don't know what they exactly what their intent was for the city of Royal Oak. We know what their intent was statewide, but there's no way to determine what those 70% of the people in Royal Oak wanted in their community in their backyard. And so to clarify. Um, what we're talking about is we're talking about restriction of retail sales instead of a real retail shop. Under the, the amendment, we actually don't have authority to ban use, ban possession, correct? Correct. The ordinance actually allows you to grow your own personal plants. We, we can't, we, we have no authority over that. This is just about establishment of retail sales mm -hmm. is what we're looking Subject at. Subject right to now. certain restrictions that are set forth in the, in the act, that's correct, yes. About transport. Thanks. Tran transport, we have no ability to control transport either. So, but I get the point I'm trying to make is we can't wait for the state. Right. You're right. We're not steering down the barrel of a gun unless you want to say it's a, it's a barrel that's a, it's a year long. Right. But eventually, we need to make a decision, and we have to make a decision soon enough that, that if we are going to go forward 
and allow recreational uses, recreational establishments within the community, we have to give ourselves enough time to establish the framework in the event that the state doesn't. Because to be honest, I'm not optimistic that the state's going to be able to get it done. Commissioner Lavasser. I'm wondering if a sunset provision might address the concerns that Mr. Gillum has, as well as Mr. Uh, Commissioner DeBuck, and, and just your perspective on that. What kind of sense? Well, yeah, what do you mean? Like the ordinance is in effect until this date? Exactly, or it, it could be either a date specific or it could be a date measured by when the licensing structure is established by the state, something along those lines. Again, I don't think we can just say until the point that the licensing structure is established by the state because the state may not establish a structure. And then by default, under the proposal, um, someone would be able to make application for a license from the city, regardless of what ordinance we have on the books at that point in time. So, I mean, if we, if we have an ordinance that says we're not going to until the state, uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to figure out the appropriate way to phrase it. If we just put the sunset provision in, um, I don't think that sunset provision would survive the state's failure to establish the framework. I think we would still be obligated to have a framework in place on a local level. All right, so if we had a sunset that said the sooner of this date or six months from, that wouldn't accomplish the mission? I think if you if you want to have an ordinance that has a sunset in it, then we should pick the uh, uh, the year from the effective date of the of the uh, of, of the proposal, because that's the period of time that the state has to establish the uh, the regulatory framework. And then in the meantime, we'd still have to take a look at the question, see how the state was doing, I suppose. But I, I, I'm not sure that would address Mr. Twing's concern, which is wanting to see what the. Well, well, all I'm asking for under this resolution is that you direct the city attorney and staff to bring back an ordinance to you for your consideration that would address some of the things you're bringing up tonight. It's I'm not looking for uh, the actual provision to that ordinance this evening. Perhaps it will have a sunset provision in it. Perhaps it'll be a simple moratorium. I'm just looking for something on the record that helps the administration and staff articulate out to the general public that keeps calling the planning office asking when they can open that you can't open until <laughs> X date. <laughs> Lots of entrepreneurs all of a sudden. Sure, Douglas. Uh, never mind. Mr. Mr. Pruch. I guess I don't have any difficulty with saying to the 74% of the people who voted for this proposal, and I was one of them, that it's one thing to be able to say, yes, I approve of the recreational use of marijuana, which is what we voted for, but it's a secondary issue for your community to effectively put together land use frameworks in place so that we can effectively administer this program. I think that the 70% are, are intelligent enough to understand that there's a difference between approving the overall use and having an effective land use pr framework in place. And I think we can essentially say, until that time that we have a framework in place, either supplied by the state or by default by us, we're not going to move forward with giving anybody a license or even talking to anybody about a license. So I, I think that's effectively what this resolution does and when, what the ordinance will do when it comes back to us, um, and if we approve it, is say, granted, you know, yes, the, the vast majority of you approve of this use, but... Um, in the meantime, we've got to put together a structure. I mean, it's the same thing with liquor licenses. I mean, if you were to put, you know, should we consume alcohol, should we not consume alcohol? My guess is that the percentage would be even higher. But that doesn't mean that we just don't have a structure in place to effectively sell it and, and, and use it in our community. That's a different thing. What we're asking for is, you know, we're going to need to put this together. We're going to rely on the state. And as a default, we're going to have to be doing it. But in the meantime... Don't talk to us about licensing because it ain't going to happen because the framework's not in place yet. 
I agree with Commissioner Perush. We have really two unknowns. One, what is the state going to do? And two, how do we solicit the input from our community between now and then to really understand, you know, what exactly um, is best for, for Royal Oak and how we do this? Uh, I think even some options at public comment came out tonight to, to listen to some of the experts in the field and the industry and understand, you know, how they see this rolling out and what's best and what are the, how do we make this, you know, a, something positive for the community versus, you know, just uh, falling by the waysides of defaults, right? So I'd like to be proactive about it, but one of the key things for me is really hearing from our residents um, the 70% that, you know, approve this. It shouldn't be another referendum on, you know, whether or not this is something we do. It should be how it's going to be done in the city of Royal Oak. Commissioner Dubuck. So, I, again, my question is, is this not effectively done through a moratorium that doesn't seem to be at odds with the direction from our community? Can't we say an 18-month moratorium or until such time uh, as the city commission, you know, receives direction from the state and is able to determine, you know, how we want to move forward. Wouldn't a moratorium effectively say we're not issuing any licenses for sale? Well, I think it has to be through an ordinance. That's, that's already the case. A moratorium can be an ordinance. No, only for sure. Well, I guess, and, and clearly what I'm talking about here is semantics and making sure that whatever right. we do, and whatever, whatever it reads in the paper doesn't sound like we're sticking a finger in the eye of our voters uh, six days after this overwhelming turnout and overwhelming support. I want to make sure that we're doing this thing. We're doing it because it's logical to make sure that we have a structure in place that understands what the direction we got was and how we want to go forward. I think just straight up prohibition on the books until some future commission changes that is out of sync with, with the direction we got from our community. Mr. Macy. So, but that's already the case. It's already the case that there is a moratorium on license. You cannot get a license right now because the state is not issuing licenses. And until a year has passed and with this out the state taking action, the city isn't issuing licenses either. So we're drafting an ordinance to say what is already existing based on state law. So I don't, I don't understand what the point of this is. And I 100% agree with Commissioner Dubuck that this seems to be going against what the, what the residents just told us. And I think if we're going to be directing use of staff time, we should be directing staff to figure out how we're going to seek community input on this. Are we going to have a town hall? Are we going to send out a survey? How are we going to find out what the community wants? And we have time. It's been stated several times at this table already. It's probably going to be pretty close to that year, if not even longer. Um, so I don't, you know, we're staring down the barrel of a year-long gun. That's, we've, we've got a year. We've got plenty of time to do this. And the ordinance we're talking about allows Mr. Thwing to say what he can already say right now. There's no, there's no means of issuing a license in the state of Michigan right now. I don't, I don't understand the purpose of the ordinance. Commissioner Douglas? Um, I, I take your point, um, but I, maybe here's a possible solution to that. Because um, I understand, I mean, if the, if the you know, law calls for an ordinance, we need to pass an ordinance, not a resolution. So what if we were to... Um, approve an ordinance as described here, but simultaneously instruct, uh, pass a resolution instructing staff um, specifically to seek public input and by, you know, if the state hasn't established guidelines by X date to um, write our own guidelines, knowing that other organizations are going to be writing those suggested rules as well. I mean, MML and MTA are going to be working with legislators and with staff in Lansing to come up with that language. And, you know, we've seen in other cases, even when the state didn't pass or didn't, the legislature didn't pass something, um, MML's guidelines still were useful. I mean, we're, we're following that in the, the water uh, 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 authority thing. So two different actions that would accomplish all of that. Mr. Macy. So I'm, I still oppose the, the ordinance because I think it's thumbing the nose of the residents for no reason at all. And it just seems to me that there's, there's a better way to be using the resources that we, that we have here. These are staff resources. And I, I want Mr. Twing to be able to say what he needs to say, but I, I, I guess I'm, I feel that he can do that already. Um, and that we're, we're taking action against, the, against the, the will of the residents without having any direction, and it doesn't seem that to be a reason to do that. Mr. Gelling, can you uh, help answer that question? I know uh, Mr. Twing brought it up, uh, you know, in the sense of contacts uh, with the, 
you know, city, but maybe from a legal context, um, the presumption being made, is, it, is that true that, you know, for a year we don't have any negative consequences if we simply, you know, take no action at all? I mean, I guess um, that's a statement being made. Is that logic accurate? <clears throat> well, from a legal standpoint, but again, my concern is that we really don't have a year. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a year until either the state is going to have a framework in place or we're going to have to have a framework in place. And so we can't wait for a year to find that out because we're not going to be able to put a framework in place ourselves overnight. That's going to take some time, whatever that framework is going to be, if there's going to be a framework. So, I mean, I think realistically we, we may have maybe six months to work with, not a year. Well, and, but that goes a little bit to my point in the sense that if you adopt an ordinance or have an ordinance that's drafted by the city attorney that prohibits, you have something in place. You've taken an action, you have something in place that says, we're opting out. Till you change that, whether it's six months, nine months, or you wait a year and see what the state writes, you've opted out. You're done. You don't have to spend any more staff time on it. That's kind of where I'm coming from. The, the state side, they have a year to do it. There's nothing that says that they might not do it sooner than that. Mr. Macy, I'll bet you lunch. <laughs> well, yeah. well, that's the thing. I mean, it's not like we're going to be surprised overnight. The thing is, passing this ordinance tonight sends a message. We're not going to allow this in Royal Oak. Whether or not that's, in, in fact, what, our, what we're intending to do, whether or not that's, in fact, what the residents were telling us, it's certainly sending that message. That's what's going to go out. So it seems to me we should think about the message we're sending. If there's not a legal reason to be sending that message any time in the next six months, I don't understand why we're sending it today. Douglas. Well, and Mr. Twing said, you know, if you pass this ordinance, then staff doesn't have to spend any time on it. I think what I'm hearing here is we want staff spending time on this. Um, we want that community feedback. Um, and, and if necessary, you know, we want our own rules um, to govern these retail establishments. And, and I will say this, um, if you oppose the marijuana ordinance and you don't want stores in our city because you oppose it, you're kind of taking a beggar your neighbor approach saying, oh, let Ferndale do it or we'll go down to Detroit. If you're in favor of the marijuana ordinance, then you should also be in favor of the stores that sell it and of the revenue that it will generate for our city. So, I mean, I think it, either side of the coin, we need to be considering allowing these establishments. And I would argue that anyone that voted for the ordinance could be for both of those situations. That's where the community feedback is absolutely critical. I agree. I mean, I'm not, I, look, to me, whether it's an ordinance, I mean, I'd, I'd like to hear more about what the commission thinks. But for me, um, you know, when you make a motion or not make a motion or whatever it may be, um, to me, community input is important and having some semblance of control to make sure that we're not reacting in the last minute and it doesn't become a wild west and we have no planning, no land use, no zoning, everything's rushed and, you know, we screw everything up. That's the worst thing that can happen. So for me, I want to make sure this is a thoughtful process with a tremendous amount of community engagement and input and a tremendous amount of consultation from our staff and from experts in the industry. Because, I mean, this isn't just about whether or not you're permitting something. I mean, there's economic factors, there's pros, there's probably cons that people can come up with. But for me, whether that's done through an ordinance, whether it's done by doing nothing, whether it's done through a resolution, if we achieve those goals and make sure we have a thoughtful process in place with lots of community input, you know, you have my support. But I'm hearing staff make a succinct recommendation here that seems to achieve that. Commissioner Macy. With respect, it's a policy recommendation, which is the job of this body. Commissioner Dubot. And there's nothing in this recommendation that moves us down the track toward getting where we want to be, which is having a structure in place. So I've only heard somebody, Commissioner Douglas, make a half proposal here motion. 
So I don't think any of us, I haven't seen anyone here disagree with the strategy of getting community input. Am I right? I haven't seen anyone here disagree about the fact that our residents voted for this statewide. I don't see anyone here disagreeing that we may not fully understand the full intent. We need the community engagement. What I don't see is any sort of action or no action on the table. Commissioner Pruch. All right, because it's almost midnight, I will make a motion that we approve this resolution that's in front of us this evening directing the staff to prepare an appropriate ordinance to completely prohibit within the boundaries of the City of Royal Oak all marijuana establishments. And secondly, direct the staff to be put together a uh, program of community engagement um, for the creation of marijuana establishments within the City of Royal Oak that will engage as many um, public constituencies as as possible. I'm babbling now because it's so late. But that's I have a two-part resolution. One is to approve what is in front of us, and secondly is to direct the staff to put together a framework for public engagement on this issue um, so that we can um, work toward a framework for marijuana establishments within the community. I'll second that. Moved by Commissioner Roos, a second by here. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner Douglas. Discussion. Commissioner Dubuck. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to support the motion just because I think it's at best a terrible message to stand, send six days after an election to prohibit the very thing that uh, residents overwhelmingly voted in favor of. Uh, our actions should all be very positive uh, in trying to determine what exactly that direction is. And if we go down that track and build build out a question, you know, a structure for retail, uh, you know, worst case, like we. We have the option to put it on the ballot. It allows us to do that, let our residents decide if they want to allow whatever retail plan we put together. If the commission doesn't doesn't feel like they have a clear enough direction from the from the community, um, but that should be really where our focus is: is, is figuring that out, not uh, not six days later uh, passing a uh, prohibitive uh, ordinance. Mr. Macy. Yeah. I'm also not going to be supporting this. I would like to see, uh, have some community engagement and then perhaps we could revisit the ordinance after we've had some part of community engagement. So maybe three months from now, still in plenty of time, we could revisit the issue and see where we are after we've heard something from our residents about what this means. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I mean, I understand the point that, you know, there's a, uh, you know, someone could misconstrue the message that we're sending, but I think Commissioner Perush was pretty clear in the motion. Um, you know, I, I think it's a technical thing that we're doing to say, hey, you know, there's no intent on this commission to hastily rush anything into place, and we have to wait till we get more information from the state, more input from the public, and part of this resolution, in fact, establishes that um, first step to make sure we get more information um, so we can implement this in a way that's best for Royal Oak where, uh, with the intent of the voters. So, I, I mean, I get both sides, but, you know, staff also has some concerns and they've studied this inside and out and, um, you know, Commissioner Douglas. You know, even though I initially proposed this and seconded the motion, I, Commissioners Dubuck and Macy have persuaded me and I think I'm going to vote against my own motion. <laughs> Was it your motion? Uh, <laughs> My idea. All right. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. no. Hands of the no's. Okay. The motion passes. Right. I'm, Commissioner Gibbs, did you vote? I didn't hear a voice over there. I didn't know, so it's a yes. <laughs> I didn't know, so it's a yes. There you have it. All right. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the meeting. If there's nothing else for the betterment of the people of Royal Oak, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Commissioner Lavasser. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Lavasser. Is there a second? Commissioner Macy. Very good. Raising your hand so we can see it. We have a second by Commissioner Macy. Um, any discussion on this motion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Adjourned.